Hello everyone and very good afternoon. Um, welcome to the last session of this CypherTrust training camp uh, where today we are going to cover first uh, uh, the technical deep dive of iShare uh, followed by uh, some concepts in CypherTrust um, IAM mechanism which are basically based on iShare um, after which uh, a session uh, will be conducted on iPhotos marketplaces, explaining to you the whole marketplace functionality. Um, and uh, in the end, um, and presentation where uh, we will explain the overall uh, iPhotos building blocks um, uh, using a reference example and how all these uh, individual components that you have been learning about uh, since last few days, um, how they all come together and help you in setting up your own data space. So let's begin um, uh, with iShare first. So today I'm, I'm going to present uh, about uh, uh, the, uh, the technical deep dive of iShare, which is an extension of the iShare session that we had on Monday. Um, let's begin. Uh, so uh, a quick recap in the iShare role model, uh, which I explained previously, um, I'll briefly explain. So in iShare, uh, as you can see on the screen, is what the role model is, uh, where you have in the red um, uh, color um, uh, the icons, which are for data consumer, data provider, and data owner, right? So these are the parties who are interested in exchange of data. And in the middle layer, you can see certified parties, um, as we call it in iShare. They are the ones which provide roles or services um, within iShare framework and within data spaces um, uh, to these data sharing parties um, uh, that enables them uh, to share data in a secure and trusted manner. Um, let's go through uh, each role a bit. Um, so um, the service consumer or data consumer some, uh, sometimes as we call it, um, it is basically a role where um, yeah, you as a service consumer, you consume particular service from, that is provided by a service provider. Um, the service um, uh, consumption means doesn't always necessarily mean that you always consume data. You can sometimes also provide data, by the way. And that is why we call it more of a service consumer. Um, uh, it can be a human or a machine. And accordingly, um, uh, the flows machine-to-machine um, -machine or human-to-machine flow are applicable in that sense. Um, and when uh, it is a human service consumer, uh, it always uses an identity provider um, to uh, identify itself to the service provider, right? Um, a service provider um, is mainly in this context uh, um, providing services related to data um, and not services like authorization, registry, identity provider, marketplace, or those. So in, in this sense, it is a service uh, provider whose services are being consumed by the service consumer. Um, normally, the data owner or entitled party um, uses um, a service provider to maintain its own data, either because it has um, uh, this service provider is its um, uh, ERP or CRM or other backend system provider uh, or similar systems or in any SaaS solutions that a uh, service provider is hosting. And as a result, it already has all that data from the data owner and data owner simply um, uh, authorizes service consumers to get data directly from the source. Um, so these service provider are more from that perspective. And for service providers, um, uh, again, they have to support both uh, in, in iShare terms, they have to support both flows, machine to machine and human to machine. Uh, these flows will have a deeper look in a bit. Um, uh, and of course, uh, they, uh, they are the ones who determine uh, what data to provide how, uh, along with uh, uh, the entire party. Some reference open source um, implementations of service providers, uh, some links are there uh, that you can see on the screen. They are, they are the GitHub links uh, to, to some open source reference implementations. 
um entitled party uh, sometimes also we call it data owner um, uh, is basically a party who has entitlement or the first right over the data in the question that service consumer is interested in getting from the service provider um remember these are roles and it can happen that the service provider and entitled party are one and the same organization but they 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 can play both the roles at the same time um, for example because they they own their own data and they host uh, the services as well on their own infrastructure that could uh, that is a very well valid scenario and in that case it itself becomes entitled party however when it is uh, a third party service provider which is just acting on behalf of an entitled party then usually these are different organizations uh irrespective of that entitled party remains um uh, the, the entitled party uh, no matter where who hosts the data and uh, it, only it has the right uh, uh, to to give access uh, to relevant other organizations to that data um let's look at some of the certified roles that we have defined in iShare um iShare satellite uh, um uh, is uh, is a role which um is essentially um uh, a directory of all the participants iShare satellite is actually based on uh, distributed ledger technology based on hyperledger fabric so every satellite is uh, just a node on that network and that what that means is um uh when a participant is registered at any of the satellites and that participant is um uh, equally visible in all other data spaces where uh, other satellites are there so um, that allows you to have uh, a basic level of interoperable trust between participants even across different data spaces uh but obviously um, uh, within a satellite or within a data space the satellite of the data space facilitates uh, uh, the discovery and uh, uh, the the trust aspects uh, for any participant uh, or between the participants of that data space so um, how that is done we will see it in in a bit in with an example of how i share flows work and as part of that how you as a participant can Uh, trust the other participants within the within the same network the identity provider role um, is uh, defined in iShare uh, such that identity of humans are stored or pro- presented or authenticated within the network um, so all the service providers can um, use uh, or connect to any identity providers um and as well as all the service consumers um uh, specifically the human service consumers can choose their own identity providers uh to authenticate themselves to any of the sh- service providers within the data space right um it is essentially based on uh, or derived from open id connect the the, the flows and the uh, the way it interacts with each other however um, there are some modifications necessarily uh, uh, made in order to make it suitable for organization to organization data sharing um, uh, as opposed to open id connect which is uh, a general standard for uh, general internet use um, where it also caters to uh, public um, uh, services or social services like social media and others um the key difference between uh, these two is that you need le- a certain level of assurance as minimum when you are dealing with organizational data versus on social media for example um of course uh, and uh, the framework itself also supports various level of assurances of identity providers as well as of the identities um so the service providers depending on the criticality of the data uh, may require that identities are assessed at certain level of assurance uh, which gives them enough trust in order to share the data with right party right um uh, the other role that is defined as certified role in iShare is the authorization registry um the authorization registry provider role is basically um Uh, a service provider who provides um, uh, or facilitates entitled party uh, 
um, uh, to enable um, uh, describing authorizations for its data um, uh, to service consumers, right? And the authorization registries um, uh, providers can choose uh, how they implement uh, the authorization registry itself. Uh, and all they have to do is make sure that they 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 implement Dishers compliant APIs that are mentioned in Dishers specifications. They can use multiple sources of data like policy database, backend systems of the uh, service provider and title parties, even the, the, the Active Directory or, or, or directories where um, uh, organization stores uh, rights and identities of its own employees and applications um, and various other sources possible um, and, and determine on the fly if necessary uh, whether a party should have authorization to some data or not. Right. Well, um, that was about the role model and uh, today we will look at um, also uh, what Aisha brings and that is essentially uh, focused on trustworthy identification, authentication, authorization. Remember that iShare is data agnostic. So um, what data you want to share and how you want to share it uh, with any uh, connection mechanism as well as in any standards, uh, using any standards or formats, iShare does not um, uh, restrict you from that perspective. Uh, however, um, in order to uh, share any data, uh, you can logically talk about it in two uh, steps. The first step is before you share the data, you want to identify, authenticate and authorize, um, check the authorizations of the par party with whom you want to share the data. And uh, then the actual data sharing uh, follows. So what elements or what, how, how I share enables in these aspects is what um, uh, we see on the screen. So we support different interaction models. So machine to machine and human to machine. We'll look at these uh, flows in detail. Um, what it facilitates is basically flexible authorizations. We'll also have a brief look at the uh, the policy model, um, uh, which on which the request response model of authorization registry APIs are based. Um, of course, authorization registries um, are free to also store policies in the same format, but they can choose to store policies in different formats as well. But uh, to give the, um, to explain the advantage of using this uh, authorization model, um, uh, which allows you to have a lot of flexibility in, in terms of what you define as policy, as well as portability of identities, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that human uh, service consumers can choose their own identity providers uh, to authenticate themselves to any of the service providers, uh, as well as they can switch to different identity providers um, when when they want without having uh, necessarily impacted uh, the whole flow of how they in they identify themselves to the service providers. And in all, what this enables is possibility of doing delegations. So not only can uh, entitled party authorize just a service consumer, but it can also authorize um, and um, uh, uh, and service consumer, but service consumer can further delegate uh, those rights down to its own partners or vendors. Um, and in the end, this enables uh, with the delegations uh, of the rights, uh, what it enables is that uh, the, the data uh, which the party should consume is consumed directly from the source. So you always get up-to-date information um, and reduce the inefficiencies um, that are um, seen usually in the paper-based um, uh, business operating models. Um, further, uh, there is uh, the customer in control or the data owner is in control because when it specifies the authorizations because it can specify it at on attribute level. Um, it gives um, uh, particularly granular access um, uh, rights possibilities um, uh, to be authorized to service consumers. But at the same time, it also has uh, facility to provide with 
data licenses, which essentially control what the consumer of the data can do with that data, even after it has been shared already with them. So, um, and and this is all, of course, uh, protected by uh, the legal framework um, that iShare brings. Um, so, uh, it's not only about just uh, giving the rights, but also controlling what the other party can do with that data. Let's have a, uh, um, a deeper dive into um, any IAM transaction that happens in iShare using iShare framework. Uh, these are the basic elements um, uh, we see in all the flows. Um, you will and and here I attempt to make a, make it more familiar to you all these concepts that we use in Asia. Um, so four key key elements um, that we will talk about is certificates, which are which basically means digital certificates, um, uh, JWTs. Uh, I will only briefly introduce uh, JWTs because um, it's uh, generally known JSON web tokens, uh, and there is a lot of material available from uh, from the specification itself. Um, so, you, uh, so for further reading, you can also refer to that. Um, what we call as client assertion in iShare, what it is, and um, yeah, when to use what, um, and an access token. So, in the end, um, yeah. The, the IAM transaction can only happen once you have a token or data sharing transaction can happen only once you have the token, right? So let's um, understand first what is a digital certificate. It's a digital file um, uh, used for integrity and authenticity to prove an integrity and authenticity of information or the claims that it has. Um, uh, it is essentially at, at a very base level, it's a, uh, a pair of keys, basically public key and private key. Uh, public key, of course, means that you can share the public key with the world and private key is basically the one that you uh, protect with yourself and you never share that uh, key with anyone. Um, digital certificates generally provide um, information about the owner of the, of the digital file and as well as uh, more details about what um, uh, what that certificate is about and um, uh, for example when it is about SSL certificates which are used for um, HTTPS connections to websites um, it also includes information about the domains that are uh, um, for which this certificate is valid uh, but there are other types of certificates as well like um, organizational qualified seal certificate which uh, allows uh, you to digitally sign on behalf of your organization as an authorized person from that organization um, and, and various others. Certificates are not only used for signing, sometimes these digital certificates are also used for encryption purposes. Uh, so depending on the use case and the types of certificate, you can use them for various purposes. Uh, so, as I said, uh, a digital certificate has two parts, public part and private part. Um, and together, some, some certificate format support uh, uh, you to have both the keys in, in one file, whereas some certificate formats do not allow that and you have to store them as two separate files. Um, here on the example on the screen, you see is a P12 um, uh, format. Um, which allows you to store both a public key and private key in, in a single file. iShare relies uh, uh, quite a lot on the PKI certificates uh, to verify organizational identities. Um, so uh, I, as I've already explained, um, iShare uh, uses uh, one of the CEF, key CEF building blocks called EIDAS. Um, and um, uh, the, it uses extensively um, uh, digital certificates in order to establish uh, the validity of any identity tokens that are there. Um, you will see how that is uh, arranged in a bit. Right. Um, and of course, what is private key is um, private key is used to uh, either sign or encrypt information. 
and uh, with that private key whenever you have signed it can always be validated using the public key corresponding public key and that's why you need to share the public key with uh, with all the parties that want to validate your signature however you never share your private key with anyone because uh, with that they can also sign on your behalf as i mentioned there are various encodings and file formats that are uh, there for an um, a digital certificate some of them are listed here which are most commonly found um, and uh, you can see that they are basically categorized into two formats one is which is based on uh, base64 format and one which are binary types so we saw an example of p12 file which is actually a binary type called pkcs number 12 um this is a binary format and that that is why it allows you to store um uh, uh, both private key and public key in the same file and it is always protected with the password um but more details can be found about these specific types uh, uh, over uh, if you if you look for them on internet but keep in mind when you see this file extensions you know that you are looking at digital certificates um i have included some information general information for your help um specifically uh, there is a cheat sheet uh, that we have provided uh, in order to understand some basic concepts of um, digital certificates as well as um, there is a basic script available um, in aisha github which allows you to uh, convert um, a digital certificate or extract digital certificate in the formats that you need to use in aisha let's continue so then let's move to the next topic uh, that is uh, json web tokens or jwts uh, or jots sometimes as people call it um what what are these um it's basically um, and base64 encoded json objects uh, and oh, most of you must be familiar that json is a um, uh, is a standard for uh, uh, storing or structuring data in key value pairs uh, of course it also supports nesting of information um, uh, but it it is much more simpler format as compared to say other examples like xml right um but what is jwt is basically it is um, uh, also a json object but uh, a base64 encoded and it has it is essentially divide um, uh, can be seen in three different parts all together which make a uh, a jwt so as you can see on the screen that um, the the first part is uh, the header so it gives more details about the object itself um and it has some attributes which specify what that object is uh, about uh, then is the payload which where you will store all the data that you want to send to someone and the third part is the signature where um, uh, based on the first two parts uh, so uh, the first two uh, parts is header and payload is what you use um, uh, what you with the private key you sign that information and the resulting information is uh, the signature and that is the third part of a jwt so uh, as you can see what you input versus what you output on the right in this table and when you attach that all together with um, uh, uh, combine those uh, three different parts with a dot that together represents a total jwt so uh, with with this basic understanding of jwt um, uh, we will introduce you to the concept of what we call as client assertions uh, a client assertion in i share is uh, essentially a jwt um, for which we have specified how that jwt should look like right um, this is a client assertion is usually an um, identity claim token basically i as a consumer i will generate my own client assertion with the claims about my identities and i will sign it and send it to the service provider to identify myself that is in essence what we call as client assertion in i share 
Um, so as we have uh, defined uh, how the JWT or client assertion should be created. So in adder, we need uh, these three attributes to be specified always. And with this, with these values, uh, specifically for uh, AL algorithm and the type, uh, for XYC, the value is basically your XYC digital certificate or the public part of your certificate. And in the payload, we have defined all the attributes that you need to specify based on your um, identifiers, as well as the time. Uh, so uh, the different time and the expiry time of this client assertion, right? Once you have this information, how do you generate a client assertion is basically using your private key of your EIDA certificate or equivalent certificate. Basically, you, um, uh, you combine the header information and payload information and you sign it with your private key. So you get the third part that is your uh, signature. And when you combine that all together um, uh, with a dot, for example, as previously explained, then you get a total JWT, which is what we call as client assertion in Aisha. Um, this is a uh, prerequisite step in order to connect to any other party in Aisha uh, that you generate this client assertion for yourself. So we'll have a look at the machine to machine flow in, in a bit. But essentially here I'm explaining um, uh, that when a service consumer called ABC Trucking Company wa server wants to connect to uh, Warehouse 13 um, server, which is a service provider, then it simply generates the client assertion on its own. Uh, the, the ABC Trucking signs it, uh, it's a signed JWT, which it sends at the token endpoint of the service provider saying, hey, uh, this is my token, can you validate and give me an access token? So in, in the client assertion, uh, uh, you can see that this is how the request is sent uh, and, and a client assertion that is the JWT is attached in the request. Um, on the service provider side, and the service provider decodes that uh, client assertion validates it um, on various parameters. And when it is satisfied that um, it is indeed uh, the authentic uh, identity token, then it issues an access token, um, a bearer access token back to the service consumer. Using this token, basically now service consumer can um, request any data from service provider. provider uh, of course, the service consumer must have authorization to access that data, right? So let's, um, um, so I, in, 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 in the following slide, you will see that I'm talking about uh, machine to machine flow, M2M as we call it. And on this screen, you can see some highlights about this flow. Uh, on the right, uh, you can see also the sequence diagram of how a typical uh, authentication sequence looks like in machine to machine scenario. Um, in iShare, it is important to remember that data is always shared between two organizations directly. So it's always a peer-to-peer -peer connection and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of data. Uh, third party or there is no intermediary who, who needs to get your data in between in order to pass you the data. This may... Um, uh, it may happen that you need um, a translator service in, in between in some, some cases when you cannot understand the data formats from other providers. In that case, you may designate a translator to, to act on your behalf to get the data. But essentially what Aisha enables is peer-to-peer -peer data sharing between two organizations. Um, as I already explained to you, a client assertion is um, a way uh, or an identity token of service consumer that it sends uh, after signing to the service provider uh, to um, to authenticate itself um, uh, as an identity, right? Um, the flow, um, this flow and, and the further details are explained. Uh, you can find the link here to our dev portal where this is explained. Similarly, for human to machine um, interaction, uh, a similar flow is there. However, because now, um, uh, of course, it's not two servers talking, but 
also a human element is uh, present which needs to interact with either a portal or an application uh, the steps are a bit different because now you in also introduce identity providers um, because remember that um, humans in iShare uh, are always represented via identity providers the reason is that um, the identity providers um, maintain certain level of assurance while onboarding uh, human identities um, onto itself so that the other organizations or service providers can be um, assured of the uh, of the identity of a particular human representing a particular organization and, and because this is business to business data sharing you need to be sure that you are sharing the data with an employee of the organization with whom you intend to share this information right so again here um, uh, in this case now uh, uh, the sequence diagram is further explained and um, you can find the full uh, readable format of this sequence diagram on the link here which is also on our dev portal let's take a quick look at the policy uh, model that uh, of authorization registry that i was talking about note that here i am only explaining the model of of this policy uh, uh, but it is not mandatory for authorization registries to store policies in this model uh, however you can see uh, the benefits of using this model and you may choose to store your policies in this model so you can see in, at the beginning you see um, the not before and not on or after that specifies the time um, when this policy is active so you can specify it for few seconds to few years or forever based on that um, then you also see the policy issuer and the access subject so the issuer is the identity of the of the issuer of this policy essentially this issuer has rights over the data resource that you will see in the policy set um, and it is the further authorizing uh, the access subject to whom uh, it grants certain rights on this data set right then you can see the max delegation that uh, you remember um, uh, we talked about delegation um, and the possibility for data owners to keep control of data even after it has been shared so with these elements uh, the data owner remains in control by for specifying that um, with the delegation depth uh, levels um, basically it, it can restrict uh, for, for the delegation limitations on on the authorizations so uh, when uh, the delegation depth is set to zero that means the receiver of this rights cannot further delegate this rights to another organization or another identity however in this example you can see five that means uh, company a will delegate this right to b b to c c to e d and d to e that's a level of uh, delegation that is allowed in in that perspective um, and you also see licenses here you see iShare.001. dot um, that's a tag for the data license you can also find these data license spec uh, specifications on iShare website uh, but these are essentially uh, um, the data license tags and each data license tag means something uh, it restricts the the access subject in this case um, in terms of how they are allowed to use this data when they receive it um, example of this usage condition can be that um, the access subject can use this data only for once um, and especially only when they are transporting the goods because the example is about container um that's one example the other example very open would could be that um, uh, the the policy issuer does not uh, or the data owner does not mind how the access object is going to use this data um, it, it it's sort of an open data for them that could be another end of spectrum of data licenses so um that that is about control um now you can see an example of uh, uh, resource so 
in 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 this policy model a resource is essentially a data set which uh, uh, which you want to control uh, or give rights to and basically it has three open uh, open text fields basically type identifiers and attributes under resource um, the values within this are not defined in iShare so it is um, up to the participants involved what they want to store and share with each other and define what these types identifiers and attributes can be so it can be as you can see in in the example this is based on gs1 standard the container and the uh, uh, as a type the identifier is marked as currently as wildcard so of course identifiers and attributes can contain wildcards but it can be very specific like attributes are specified that it can only read or write to ETA or weight information of the container, for example. However, as I mentioned, these are open text fields. So you can also put URNs or uh, reference to existing uh, data standards or smart data models, for example, um, which define what type of resource it is. And um, uh, you can define them based on type identifier and attributes. Then you see within that actions. Uh, so these are the actions that are allowed on the resource. Basically, here it is an example of read and write, but you can also use different actions like um, HTTP methods, for example, get, put, post, uh, or other examples uh, that you may think of. Again, this is not um, uh, predefined in ISO specifications. You are free to use actions. Um, uh, which are understandable within your data space by participants. There is an additional environment which is optional. That is environment under which you see service providers. Um, assuming that you use this policy model for storage, the idea here is that when you specify a service provider identifier, then this policy is only applicable when um, the access subject is accessing this resource from this service provider. So for example, you use um, two or more service providers and and your data is residing at both of them and you want to restrict access to this particular access subject um, uh, to only one of those then there you specify the identifier of that service provider where uh, um, this access subject has rights to so when it has uh, when um, this access subject goes to another service provider of yours and try to access the same data, it will be denied because it is not listed in the um, uh, in the service provider uh, environment uh, attribute. Then you look at the rules uh, section. So first rule that is effect is permit is mandatory in, in this model in the sense that whatever resource you have mentioned uh, up um, above is what you are essentially permitting to and additionally you can specify exceptional scenarios so in in this example you can see that resource of type container with uh, any identifier is allowed to be accessed by this access subject however deny it when uh, the container identifier is of the, is this one specifically mentioned here um, and an action is uh, to read read that information about the weight so when this is the situation it will reject it else uh, it will uh, permit it but this is just to give you an understanding of how this model uh, looks like and, and you can choose to uh, store your policies using this model now um, why i introduced that model to you is basically uh, the aisha the, the ars request and response model is actually derived from this model um, and here on the screen you can see the example response uh, that you as a service provider will get from an ar when you ask if a certain access subject has rights to um, some information that it is seeking for right um, so again, the policy issuer is basically who issued uh, this authorization to this access subject. And when you ask that, okay, this subject wants to access, um, uh, say, read ETA and weight information of uh, of a container, uh, based on this policy, basically will get yes, it uh, it is uh, permit. That is what it is allowed. Uh, so you can allow this access subject to read. Um, 
ETA and wait from a container. Yeah, that was um, a, more about the AR. Now I've introduced you to all the concepts. Now let's look at a fictional use case and how these flows work in detail. Uh, so step-by-step -step guide in that sense. Um, uh, of course, um, remember the concepts that I just explained to you and these are what we use in order to achieve the desired result. So with this uh, fictional use case, let me introduce to the case itself. So on the screen, you can see that there is a warehouse, there is a transporter and there is a company um, uh, which is actually uh, uh, hiring the transport company to pick up its container from the warehouse. Right, so it's a banana company, and it has its parcel or container coming in that warehouse, and it wants that ABC trucking company to to pick it up and on its behalf. Um, this is a very simple flow. Of course, there are uh, more parties involved, but to simplify it, we keep it very simple for time being. Um, so how do you map them in the Aisha role model is basically you can see that banana and company is basically freight owner, which is basically uh, from Aisha perspective is an entitled party. So it has the first right to the information about a container, which is sitting at warehouse. The warehouse 13 is basically a terminal provider. And uh, in Aisha perspective, it's a service provider because it has, though it maintains containers but on the digital twin version of it it also provides with information about the eta and weight and other aspects of the container uh, right um the abc trucking company which acts as a transporter in aisha terms is a service consumer because when it wants to pick up the container it needs to know eta it needs to know weight, weight and other elements uh, from the warehouse or from the banana and company ideally into uh, in in general world However, with iShare, the power is that um, ABC trucking company can directly fetch that information from warehouse 13, thereby increasing uh, the possibilities of making much more efficient um, transactions. And uh, Banana and Company, since it's an entitled party, chooses its own authorization registry. It is called Ask Me Anything Authorization Registry, which it uses to store authorizations, right? Um, some preparatory steps when you are actually implementing and running uh, any test using iShare mechanism. Uh, there are some steps which all participants of iShare need to take. Um, and first one basically is that um, iShare also issues via its satellites a trusted uh, list. Um, there is an API which you need to call. It gives you a list of all the CAs um, of which um, certificates uh, issued by these certificate authorities are trusted within the network. These are carefully selected um, CAs based on various parameters which enable um, uh, which enable trust in the network. This is achieved because uh, these CAs only issue certificates of certain level after they have performed certain level of validations. And these certificates are usually um, allowed to be used as signing digital certificates. So uh, the parties which are using the certificates can actually sign information uh, using the certificates. And these uh, digital signatures are legally um, acceptable in any uh, in the country where uh, or in the region where these certificates are issued. So they do stand valid in uh, legal in the in the court of law as well, and that is uh, the essential. Uh, that is very essential when you are talking about any trust framework, um, because uh, when you share this information which is signed, you can only trust it when you know uh, whether about its assurances, right? Um, Participants uh, can play different roles as I've explained. And uh, in this perspective, we are looking only from this use case perspective. So these organizations as they are mapped currently to the Aisha roles, uh, this only applies when we are discussing this use case. When we discuss another use case with the same participants, for example, they can uh, be playing different roles as well.
Yeah. So uh, this is about the trusted list. Uh, um, as I mentioned, uh, all organizations should cache this list and um, update it regularly. Uh, this step is not uh, necessary to be called always just before any machine to machine or human to machine transaction happens. However, if your cache is um, invalid or uh, old or stale or you haven't cached uh, trusted list, then you have to make sure that you, you call this because then you have all the trusted CS of which you can um, uh, of, so, so that you can validate the certificate and the signature from the client assertions that you will receive, right? Now let's look at um, how the M2M flow or machine to machine flow in this scenario that, uh, or uh, how do we achieve the, the fictional use case requirement based on this uh, flow? Um, as I mentioned, the banana and company is uh, the entire party who has a container at warehouse 13. And it wants to, um, it wants ABC trucking to Pick up that container from Eros 13. Sorry. Um, uh, but of course, um, when ABC Trucking wants to pick it up, um, it needs to know when it is expected at the warehouse and various elements like its weight, its uh, category of um, uh, the content uh, of that container, etc., so that it can take appropriate measures in order to pick, pick up the container from warehouse. Um, in traditional world, how that happens is ABC company um, goes to Banana and Company and uh, asks it all this information. And Banana and Company has to go to Warehouse 13 to fetch uh, many of this information, especially, specifically the ETA and the updated weight uh, of the container. So as you can see, uh, when more and more parties are involved in this chain, because this is a simplified version of this uh, logistics chain, um, it is very much complex uh, to fetch the up-to-date information in real time. Um, however, now we'll see with this example how uh, Banana and Company can ri give rights to ABC Trucking so that ABC Trucking can directly go to the warehouse and get all the information that it needs. So first step, and this is um, this happens as a pre-step in before the transaction happens. So as a part of a regular business process, uh, when Banana and Company makes a deal with ABC Trucking Company to uh, man, um, manage its uh, container pickups, it registers uh, in its authorization registry that it has um, uh, it has given uh, certain rights on certain attributes uh, of containers that it expects uh, ABC Trucking Company to uh, handle from warehouse 13, right? So here it simply says, I delegate rights to uh, access data regarding containers X, Y, and Z, which are the containers at warehouse 13 um, on behalf of a ABC Company, right? And it informs the ABC Trucking Company that, okay, I have arranged for your rights digitally now you can directly go to warehouse 13 um, and fetch all the information you need in order to plan the pickup, right? So in this case, now actual transaction happens or now we are talking about the actual flow of uh, when ABC trucking uh, company wants to know about the ETA of the container from warehouse 13, then how will it initiate this transaction, right? So first step, as I already explained a bit earlier, is that ABC Trucking Company server needs to connect to the warehouse 13 uh, server, and it needs to uh, first get an ident access token. And this, for this, what it does is um, it generates a client assertion at its end and sends this client assertion at the connect token endpoint of warehouse 13. Then um, uh, when the warehouse 13 receives the client assertion, what it does is it validates that client assertion, checks the certificate which was used to sign um, that client assertion. Then it also wants to check if this um, company is uh, known in the network or in the data space. So uh, the service provider or warehouse 13 in this case first connects to uh, the satellite of the data space. So again, uh, it's it's a similar process for service provider when it connects to satellite. 
that it first needs to get an access token. So it um, service provider then generates its own client assertion, which it sends to the token endpoint of satellite. And uh, the satellite validates this token and uh, validates if the warehouse 13 is a known participant in the data space. Uh, and then it generates an access token as a response, which it sends to warehouse 13. With that access token, now uh, warehouse 13 can actually ask for uh, the, the, the details about ABC trucking, uh, which it's um, identifier, as you can see here. And it can do so with the uh, querying on the party's endpoint of the satellite. So in the party's endpoint, it send, simply sends, okay, I need information about this identifier, who this identifier is and for the details about it. And in response, uh, a token from satellite uh, is sent, which includes all the details that are known at the satellite about ABC trucking company. Uh, remember that Aisha satellite itself is not a, um, uh, a certifying authority or anything. It does not issue any kind of certificate. It does not sign your um, identity tokens or anything. It simply gives the information that is stored in the satellite. Uh, and with this information, the service provider now uh, um, can validate this information against the claims that it received from the ABC trucking company in the first step, right? So after it has validated all the aspects of the client assertion and also the validity of the signature or, uh, that was um, in the client assertion, um, and after it has been sa satisfied with that, then the warehouse 13 uh, issues an access token um, uh, to ABC trucking company. Now with this access token, it can simply raise any of the uh, data endpoint. In this case, it's the service provider slash service uh, is the endpoint at warehouse 13, where it says, um, I uh, I want to get details about the container set, uh, as in when uh, when is the ETA when it is expected to be arriving at the warehouse, and my delegation rights are are at ask me anything registry. Well, there are various flows, uh, various supported ways in which uh, service provider knows how where to check or which authorization registry to check for uh, for the right authorizations. This is one of the ways where the service consumer uh, specifies that it can find the authorizations at, at a specific authorization registry, right? Um, so in this case, because um, uh, the warehouse 13 is informed by the service consumer that it, it has to check for the authorizations at Ask Me Anything uh, or authorization registry, then service provider needs to um, uh, know how to connect to ask me anything authorization registry as well as to uh, check if uh, this ask me anything authorization registry is also a recognized participant within the data space right so what it does is again it goes to the satellite um, with the same step that if the token is not valid it, it gets an access token first by sending a client expression of itself and then now um, it gets the details uh, from party's endpoint with the identifier that was shared by service consumer of the authorization registry. So in this case, it's the identifier of the authorization registry. It says, okay, give me all the details that are known about this uh, authorization registry. Uh, satellite gives um, uh, the details about the authorization registry back to service provider. And in that, um, uh, response there is a capabilities endpoint which is um, referring to all the services that are exposed by ask me anything authorization registry and in that capabilities endpoint there is uh, an entry of an endpoint called delegation endpoint which all iShare based ar uh, must implement so service provider uh, simply has to look for that delegation endpoint from the capabilities endpoint um, of that authorization registry right uh, and that way it knows um, basically also how to connect to the token endpoint also from the capabilities endpoint of the ask me anything registry so now first step again as uh, it is machine to machine transaction service provider generates a client assertion and sends it to the token endpoint of authorization registry ask me anything um, 
The authorization registry follows the same steps uh, in order to validate the client assertion. Uh, in uh, so it, it validates the JWT, it, val it checks the certificate, checks the signature, and now it also wants to check if Veras 13 is um, a known participant in iShare satellite um, and in the data space. So for authorization registry, uh, it will again connect to satellite with uh, first. Uh, get a token um, uh, yeah get a token uh, from the satellite and after it has got the token it it connects um, uh, it calls the parties endpoint basically to get more details about the warehouse 13. once it has got the details about warehouse 13 and validated it uh, along with the client assertion then um, it will return an access token to service provider right with the service provider having that access token, it will raise um, this question on the delegation endpoint of authorization registry, asking if uh, the ABC trucking is allowed to have access uh, to data of container Z. Remember, this is uh, explained in simple English. However, the request is sent in the uh, policy model as I explained earlier. So there it will uh, simply generate a JSON where it says um, where the access object is APC trucking and the resource is um, gs1.container with an identifier Z. And uh, whatever attributes that ABC trucking company is asking for is included in the request and the action, as in, uh, is it asking to read that information? In this case, yes. So it will send action as read. So because if you remember in the first step, Banana and company made that policy in the authorization registry um, which allowed access to ABC talking company on the container set. Um, the authorization registry determines yes ABC trucking company should have access to uh, information of container set. So in response it say it sends that uh, response uh, similar as explained uh, in the model that uh, I, I previously explained. But in plain English, it simply says yes, um, because it, it is permit because there is already a policy in it, right? With that, um, Warehouse 13 checks all the evidence. Uh, again, when authorization registry sends back the, the response, it is also assigned uh, JWT um, so that uh, service provider can be assured that it is indeed a valid information that it can trust in order to share data with service consumer. Um, so it, before it um, sends the data, it of course needs to validate uh, uh, the response token itself. So it checks the evidence and the certificate which was used for signing and everything. And when it is satisfied, it will then uh, send the container data back to the service consumer. So this is how um, a simple machine to machine flow looks like uh, when uh, using iShare. These are uh, here, as you see, only servers are involved. So no human identities are necessary, but only organizational identities because servers belonging to organizations are talking and they are able to establish trust based on uh, signed tokens, which are um, signed using digital certificates. Now let's extend this use case uh, a bit to explain to you the human to machine flow. Right. Um, so the, the, uh, the example is more or less the same. However, now um, uh, uh, there is an addition of a, of a service consumer, a human service consumer in this case, that's called driver X. A driver X is actually a trucker within the ABC trucking company. Um, and there is a introduction of different authorization registry in this case, uh, which is called registry X. And there is an identity provider called Sigur Logistics that is being used by the ABC trucking company or driver X to identify itself. So let's have a look how this flow would work. As I explained, driver X is a human consumer. And this is a trucker from ABC uh, trucking company, which is a transporter, right? So the pre steps here that happens before the, the actual transaction happens is a banana company uh, delegates the rights to ABC trucking company 
this is the same step this is an delegation between two organizations so banana and company is giving rights to abc trucking company that it can manage the container pickups from warehouse 13 for on its behalf um and, and um now for the simplicity sake we are um, uh, storing uh, both the the banana and company and abc trucking company uh, both are using a registry x as their authorization registry however both parties can use different authorization registries if they choose to right so in this case abc trucking company is now adding um, uh, an authorization for its own uh, driver that is driver x that it can um, act on behalf of abc trucking company for banana and company so whatever rights banana and company has given to abc trucking um, uh, abc trucking company authorizes driver x to also have the same rights basically now in this case uh, assume that driver is actually on, on the gate of um, the warehouse 13 and it wants to open the gate of the warehouse 13 so that it can pick up the container right um so what will happen is basically where at warehouse there is usually a security gate at which drivers are usually asked to identify themselves uh, currently it happens on paper paper based process and there has to be an information flow already um, from banana and company to warehouse 13 that a certain company driver will come and pick up a container at certain time uh, because warehouses are a bit restricted towards excess uh, because it may have sensi sensitive cargo or uh, or expensive cargo and it needs to protect that for, from uh, thieves basically uh, so in this case um, but as you can see that uh, there was uh, there was no information flow that we explained from that banana and company sends to warehouse 13 but instead, because the delegations of the rights are already in place, driver um, uh, of ABC company can, based on the ETA information that it previously fetched, already arrive at the warehouse um, on that specific time or around that time when the container is available for pickup. Right. So here it is um, assumed that it is already uh, determined that ETA and it is now at the front of the warehouse gate. And it is asking um, the security that can it go inside and pick up the container, right? So how does uh, now that flow digitally looks like? So instead of doing paper-based um, uh, validation of identity, assume that driver X uses uh, digital means to do so. So at the gate, there is a digital way to identify itself as a driver. Um, so driver uses that mechanism, either it's a portal or via the app with a QR code or something, it scans uh, and, and wants to log in. Um, so, but warehouse uh, needs to know the identity. So it asks uh, which identity provider driver X would like to use in order to identify itself. Uh, so that warehouse 13 can determine whether to allow access to driver or not right so it asks uh, driver x which identity provider would you like um, to use uh, driver x um, already uses secure logistics uh, or abc trucking company uses secure logistics for all its employees or uh, drivers so it says okay i can log in with secure logistics to prove my identity when it selects secure logistics the service provider sends uh, the driver uh, uh, redirects the driver to secure logistics login portal remember this is based on open id connect flow so if you are familiar with open id connect flows um, uh, these flows should sound very familiar to you right so it simply redirects to the authorized endpoint of secure logistics um, the driver to that endpoint um, uh, in that uh, uh, request itself the 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 warehouse 13 sends also the client assertion that it has generated for itself uh, because remember in iShare um, uh, service provider do not need to register identity providers or identity providers do not need to register pre-register service providers and issue client secrets and client ids um, uh, they can work with any identity provider or or any service provider both of them can work with either of them 
even when they have never interacted or never uh, registered themselves because they are all registered at the satellite which they can always verify from the satellite uh, or they are registered in a data space so they can always validate each other from uh, that they are registered in the satellite uh, in this case, um, the service provider has sent a client assertion of itself to Secure Logistics. Um, and Secure Logistics will uh, now check the client assertion, check the certificate and the validity of the client assertion. And it also, of course, wants to check if Veras 13 is a known participant in the data space uh, and can it trust and abide uh, by the rules of the framework. Right. So the first step again for secure logistics would be to get an access token from the satellite. And once with getting the token from the satellite, um, it can ask all the details about that uh, satellite knows about Veras 13. So uh, using the party send point, so it sends a request and satellite uh, responds back with all the information that is stored in the satellite for uh, warehouse 13. And this includes, uh, of course, the status of this participant as well as capabilities and other various details, right? Um, that's the response of the party token. Uh, once it has validated everything and it knows, okay, uh, this is all part of the data space and this service provider is known within the network, it can trust that, okay, um, uh, the, the, the identity that it wants to log in can, uh, it can share the data with the service provider. Um, but of course, Secure Logistics itself needs to know which of the user is trying to log in. So it, uh, it uh, sends a login screen to uh, the service consumer. Um, service consumer simply provides its credentials. Uh, now remember that um, as an identity provider, it can enforce certain level of assurance by enabling or enforcing uh, multi-factor authentication if necessary uh, when driver logs in. Uh, also, depending on the type of login um, that the identity provider uses, uh, it may or may not be multi-factor, right? Um, but certain level of assurance requires certain level of uh, uh, certain types of login features to be enabled. And this is uh, based on EIDAS framework that uh, that determines how to determine level of assurance of the login. Um, now, driver X, uh, because it selected secure logistics, it knows its identity provider login screen. It finds it familiar, so it provides all the credentials. It has it is known uh, within secure logistics, and with that credential, secure logistics uh, authenticates driver um, as uh, as a valid driver. Right. Uh, however, in order for service provider to receive all that information, um, yeah, it first sends the code back to the service provider using which it can get an access token. Right. So with the token, uh, with the code, a service provider can now request for access token from the um, identity provider. With the access token, then uh, then it asks for all the user information using the user info endpoint. And in this user info endpoint, it gets all the details about the identity of the driver as well as the organization that this driver is representing. Um, so, in as I said, it, it gives the identity of the driver and the organization that it is representing, that is APC Trucking Company. And uh, service provider then uh, validates this information. And, and now it knows, okay, this driver is coming from ABC Trucking Company. So it has to check within its own um, database uh, which containers are uh, belonging to ABC Trucking and whether any of them are ready for pickup. Um, and if they are ready for pickup, uh, has um, it, because it's uh, it's belonging, these containers are belonging to Banana and Company, and the company which is here to pick up is ABC Trucking Company. It needs to know whether ABC Trucking Company uh, should. Uh, be allowed for picking it up. So now it needs to know uh, from the authorization registry uh, whether this uh, authorization has been granted. So service provider, because it knows um, the container provided by uh, driver that it wants to pick up, uh, it knows uh, the authorization registry uh, of banana and company uh, to check if um, 
uh, ABC Trucking Company is authorized to get uh, uh, is authorized to pick up the container, right? So it sends a connect token to um, or client assertion to at the connect token endpoint of authorization registry. Um, the authorization registry validates the token, checks the certificate, signature, etc. Uh, then authorization registry also connects to satellite, uh, asks for details about warehouse 13. Um, and and um, with this, it, it knows, okay, warehouse 13 is known in the data space and it can, uh, it abides by the rules of the framework. Um, and it can then issue the access token back to the service provider. With this token, um, uh, it checks with the authorization registry if the driver X is um, authorized to get access to the container of Banana and Company. Now, remember that there are two delegations in place. So Banana and Company gave rights to ABC Trucking Company and ABC Trucking Company gave rights to driver X. So linking these two authorizations, it determines um, Yes, driver X uh, should have access to the container of banana and company. So it simply sa sends yes. Remember, these are explained in plain English. However, the request response model, as I explained previously, it needs to be used in, in that format for delegation endpoints. Now, um, since, um, yeah, so as I explained, is driver X authorized to get access to container of banana? Sorry, I'm going backwards. So uh, authorization registry sends uh, uh, the evidence back to the service provider, which is a signed version. Um, and now service provider needs to validate that and uh, satisfy itself that it is indeed a valid uh, authorization and use that to um, give access to the driver to the warehouse premises, right? Because it was able to identify and authenticate properly as well as authorize this trucker, it allowed access to uh, the warehouse premises, um, all based on data um, uh, that is already stored or uh, via the means of authorization. So now no more back channel um, information um, via phone calls or via emails is necessary, but these uh, use cases can be achieved completely digitally. Yes, that is how the human to machine flow looks like. Um, in a sense, of course, uh, when more parties are involved, uh, this becomes a, a level complex, but you can always uh, bring down the complexity of your use case to this level by uh, only focusing on involved parties in a use case and the steps that they, these parties need to take in order to uh, uh, implement the flows like this, right? So, um, so that was more on the how the flows look like. Um, on the screen now you see um, and on high level uh, the steps, basically the three step guide uh, to becoming an iShare participant and utilize um, all the benefits that iShare framework provides. Um, and the step one is basically you identify your role uh, within the framework. Um, as I explained, you can you may be playing multiple roles uh, in different use cases, but when you are um, implementing or uh, a use case, then you are only usually focused on one role, and you should focus on one role at a time to to avoid any confusion because of uh, conflicting or overlapping uh, requirements for certain roles, right? Uh, once you have determined your role um, in the use case, um, you can uh, go to the step two where you actually uh, test and develop and implement your um, uh, your specifications based on the role that is given and to facilitate you um, uh, to first understand how these roles are implemented. Um, on the dev portal, you can find uh, videos, postman collections, further explanations uh, of each role or the specifications uh, and the APIs that you need to implement as a, as a particular role. You can either implement them yourself or you can uh, download the dummy versions that are available on also the GitHub and um, uh, deploy them to, to simulate your use case essentially or implement them and, and 
uh, prove your use case is working. iShare also has a test network where you can um, uh, register first um, your test servers and, and, and uh, run this whole use case uh, on a test environment. Um, for that, we provide uh, with various components like uh, test authorization registry and uh, test satellite where you can register as a participant. Also, we can issue you a test EIDAS certificate. You can request it yourself using the link mentioned here um, uh, so that you can use that in, in during testing um, your implementations, basically. Uh, once you have done all the development and testing of your um, role as specified uh, and you are confident that uh, this, this uh, component now can be taken into production, at that time, you can go to step three and um, uh, you have essentially also uh, onboard as a participant in iShare. And for that, you uh, procure any EIDAS certificate or an equivalent certificate as, as uh, is mentioned in the framework. Um, you sign the agreements that are there. Uh, I already explained some uh, basic um, idea about uh, the multilateral contract in my previous session. Um, but uh, that is enforced via uh, signing of uh, agreements. So that is terms of use and accession agreement. Uh, you can also find these ag agreements via, uh, via the website. Uh, these, uh, these agreements are signed by all parties. And for certified parties or certified roles, there are additional agreements that they need to sign. There are some formalities like uh, providing uh, extract of Chamber of Commerce uh, and providing some other documents proving your organization and uh, public key of your EIDAS certificate. Uh, for example, when you are actually onboarding to, uh, to iShare to become a participant. And last but not least, more important one is um, you also provide with the conformance test tool report um, of your implementation to make sure that your implementation complies to the specification. And this is to make sure that you also remain interoperable with, with all other participants. In the program of IFO Trust Mentoring Program, uh, all of you will go through steps one and two. Uh, and step three is um, what you will take when you are ready to move to production. So it can happen during the, the mentoring program or it can happen after that. Um, uh, to, to reap the whole benefits of the trust framework and the legal aspects, you need to become the participant. Um, otherwise, you, you can simply use the technology, but then uh, as a standalone, that, that technology is no different than what you are using with the other standards that are available. To get the whole benefit of the framework, you essentially become participant of Aisha. Um, and with this, of course, uh, I have provided some links, uh, useful links, as I have been mentioning about our website and dev portal. So this is where you will find all the information uh, and links to, to various um, elements that we cover in iShare. With this, uh, iShare deep dive is over. I will now move to, uh, quickly move to iFortrust role model. Um, um, and, and brief explanation about iFortrust IAM. Um, a brief recap of the data space. What is a data space? Uh, as I explained in the very first session, that is the introduction session. A data space is a decentralized data ecosystem built by parties uh, who come together with a common purpose. Essentially, remember that data space is a logical construct. And it is uh, created by the participants who are interested in exchange of data. And these parties are um, mentioned here at the top in the yellow colors, that is data consumers and data providers and data owners by that, that means. Um, and in order to um, enable them to do so in a trusted manner within a data space, you need services like identity and authorization services and services like marketplace and other vocabulary or other similar services. Right. Um, this we see as minimum set of any kind of data space that you have, along with, of course, the important aspect of data space governance. So data space governance include also the trust anchor element, um, which in IFO trust is um, based on Aisha satellite model. Right. 
so with that trust um, within the data space and the governance within the data space uh, all parties can effectively and interoperably exchange data with each other even when they have never done so before and it avoids uh, bilateral contracts between the participants of data space so in in introducing to you the ifo trust role model um, uh, in as explained in the data space you have a trust provider you have a data consumer data provider and the data owner um, an identity provider role and marketplace role and authorization provider role so this these roles are bare minimum in any ifo trust based data space and um, under ifo trust umbrella and iser and fiverr uh, together brings to you open source components available for each of these roles um so uh, for for acting as a trust provider within a data space you can implement an uh, iser satellite and become an iser satellite uh, by complying with the requirements of that uh for data consumer um, open source fiber components are available which can exchange data with um, uh, ngsi ld format uh, similarly for data provider which is basically the context broker so data provider um, implements usually the context broker and uh, shares in shares data using ngsi ld format um, uh, but there are other components in order to secure um, Uh, the the context broker that is basically via kirok and kong um, for example uh, these are all provided by fiverr as compliant iser components um, then you have the identity provider uh, which is a kirok element uh, or component uh, again complied uh, complying with iser specifications there is a uh, marketplace um, fiverr marketplace component Uh, which we will learn more about in 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 a bit in the next session um, and um, the authorizations provider uh, which is based on the authorization registry role of iser uh, again the kirok component here is made compliant with that specifications um i have included this slide as an um, example of how participants are mapped to a role model this example is what you will see later in this session um uh, where we explain with this example how um, various elements of ifo trust are uh, utilized so just to give you an um, highlight in terms of uh, the dif- different organizations uh, you can see are mentioned uh, uh, near to the role so they are actually playing their own uh, playing different roles um or multiple roles within uh, within the example and depending on the use case you are in um, you have to look at uh, this organization playing that specific role right so no cheaper and happy pets are data consumer but they are also data owners packet delivery company is data provider as well as data owner and each of them brings their own identity provider as well as authorizations provider and in the example the marketplace is provided by for trust marketplace instance but um, experiments or other parties can implement their own marketplace or data spaces can implement their own marketplace um a trust provider is uh, basically based on iser satellite so an um, an fictive organization called trust foundation is running this iser satellite within this uh, data space for example so i already explained these roles um, but um, a brief recap in some of the highlighted roles is trust provider is basically the one which facilitates trust in in data space and um, many times it is also the organization which is um, responsible governing body of a data space um, however it is the one which uh, maintains the level of trust in the in the data space by following um, uh, uh, the rules of that is defined for a data space uh, which all participants are expected to follow so they they enforce those rules uh, at the participants um, by various means like auditing uh, or uh, regularly uh, uh, updating participants information in the database and and other things right 
identity provider and as i have already explained uh, in this sense uh, keyrock is the component which you can uh, deploy and run as an identity provider remember that um, just running keyrock doesn't make you an identity provider which you can register officially in in the production of iShare uh, for that you also need to comply with organizational requirements and you need to sign certified identity provider agreement uh, which has certain organizational requirements as an identity provider right similarly for authorizations uh, provider uh, keyrock as an open source component is made available as a technical component which you can use to become an authorizations provider or authorization registry provider however as an organization there are certain additional requirements apart from technical requirements that you need to fulfill and um, these are uh, assessed during the admission process um, and if you would like to learn more about them specifically if you are interested in playing any of these roles as an independent authorization registry provider or identity provider please do get in touch with us and we can um, uh, explain to you those uh, roles further those requirements further however they can also be found on iShare website via the admission process yeah and last but not least in this sense um, uh, uh, recapping the uh, 12 building blocks uh, of iFor trust um, which act as a boilerplate for creating your data spaces, the four verticals, and as you can see with the logos on, on each of those blocks, um, these are provided to you by, with Fiverr and iShare, um, uh, which explains uh, how, which gets you quickly started in making your own data space. That is it from my side today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session, and with this, I will uh, pass on. Uh, towards the next session that will be conducted by Francisco for Aquatrust Marketplace. I'm not sure if you would like to take a break in between. But I leave it to Francisco. Okay. I'll stop sharing my screen. Yes. Oh. Okay, I hope you can see my presentation properly. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you all for attending. In this uh, second part of the session that we are having today, we are going to have a look at the i4Trust Marketplace. And uh, we are going uh, to, this is the agenda that we are going to follow. Uh, we are going to start having a, a look at the Business API ecosystem generic enabler, which is the fiber component that is used in order to, that has been used to create this iFortress marketplace. We are going to review uh, some of the main concepts that uh, we have in the business API ecosystem. And then uh, I'm going to show you how we have used the business API ecosystem in order to create this uh, iFortress marketplace. Okay. First of all, let's start with the business API ecosystem. The business API ecosystem is a fiber generic enabler. Uh, which is providing the tools that you need in order to create a marketplace for the monetization of digital assets. The idea with this component is that uh, it is providing all you need in order to manage the life cycle of the product offerings. Since uh, the service registration and the product creation, uh, to the monetization, to the billing, it manages the payments and also manages uh, revenue sharing in those scenarios where there are multiple stakeholders involved in a specific offer. In addition to this, the Business API ecosystem is fully integrated with the Fiverr Identity Management Framework, as well as uh, the iShare Framework that has been presented and different uh, identity managers, as we are going to see later. And the most important point regarding the Business API ecosystem is that this software is exposing all the functionality that is providing using a set of standard APIs that has been defined by TM Forum, uh, by TM Forum organization. 
We are talking about catalog management APIs in order to create products, offers, catalogs, etc. We are talking billing management APIs, order management API for purchases. Also, usage uh, for those scenarios where we have uh, paper use, etc. Okay. Uh, in addition to this, the business API ecosystem generic enabler, uh, as I said, is a software that is intended so you can create your own marketplace. So it's highly customizable. You can create your own themes, you can create, you can provide your branding, you can provide your own look and feel, etc. So you can modify it in order to feel with your organization branding. And uh, it's integrated with multiple identity providers. So you can choose the one that is better for your needs. Of course, uh, this software is integrated with Fireware Keyrock because it's the identity manager we are providing as part of the Fireware uh, ecosystem. But uh, this is also integrated with Keycloak, which is an identity manager provided by Red Hat. And uh, in, if you have a use case where you don't need a lot of complexity and you only need login and these kind of things, it is also integrated with GitHub accounts. So you can use GitHub in order to sign in into the, the business API ecosystem software. Well, as I mentioned, this, uh, this software is intended to create a monetis, to uh, monetize any kind of digital asset. But how is this achieved in, in reality? The idea with the business API ecosystem is that the software is managing those functionalities that are common in any marketplace scenario. That's it. Uh, service registration, offering creation, offering publication, offering discovery, monetization, payment, it's managed the orders, it has some staff for activation, etc. All the functionality that is common in any uh, marketplace scenario is managed by the Business API ecosystem software. Then, all that functionality that is particular to the specific digital asset that you want to monetize is something that is included in the Business API ecosystem by providing extensions. The Business API ecosystem defines a format, is Python code. Uh, it, it is defined as a set of handlers that are triggered during the life cycle of an offer, when a product is created, when an offer is created, when a service is acquired, etc. During the life cycle, some triggers are, well, are triggered. And then uh, in this extension, implements uh, implemented different handlers. The idea here is if uh, the kind of product you are creating is something as uh, like an Android application, for example, that you are uploading, after creating the product, what you will need to do is validate that uh, that file that you have uploaded is actually an um, Android bundle. But in a not different, completely different scenario where uh, you are monetizing uh, some kind of API which is secure for so with some kind of security framework, the validation that you have to do is completely different. You have to validate that the user has permissions, that the API you are providing really exists, etc. It's quite different. And it's similar when we are talking about activation. It's not the same. Activating something that uh, is in an environment where the security is provided by roles than activating something, something where the access is managed with this ICER framework and these policies that, uh, that uh, are created into an authorization registry. There are completely different scenarios. So these particularities are implemented as part of these extensions. Is each extension defines a specific digital asset type. And then when you are registering a product, you can choose which is the digital asset type you want to sell. And then you will be asked to provide whatever metadata is needed in that specific scenario. The final thing I have to mention about this is that you are not limited to URLs. Uh, when you register a product, this might be something registered as a URL, but it also may something maybe files that you can upload into the marketplace, etc. So there are no restrictions in this in this regard. Okay, uh, the business API ecosystem is currently supporting multiple price models. Uh, since the most simple one, which is the typical free offers uh, to some stuff a little bit more complex. Regarding the free models, uh, the business ecosystem is supporting two different kinds of uh, free models, which is on the one hand, we have free models, 
which means that you have to buy the offer. It's free, but you buy, you have to buy the offer. You have to accept the terms and conditions. Basically, creating an order and follow the whole ordering process in order to get access to the service you are buying. And there are also the possibility of defining open offers. Open offers are those offers that does not need uh, to be bought in order to access to the resource. This is typically used in scenarios or use cases when we have things like open data, where, well, you have the open data, you don't need to, you don't even need to register. This is there. So you can create an open offer for this and then it is possible to access to the specific asset directly. When we are talking about the um, paid price models, the business API ecosystem is supporting three main basic price models. On the one hand, we have uh, one-time payments or uh, that are, well, typical, you pay the price and you get the offer. It's a simple one. Then we have subscriptions, which is which are the typical recurring model. Um, you pay per month, you pay per year, you pay per quarter, etc. And uh, the business API ecosystem software is also supporting pay-per-use, which means that you can uh, you are going to pay for the actual usage you are making of the uh, offer that you have bought. In addition to these three basic uh, models, there are uh, these three basic models can be enriched with some advanced functionality that allows you to create dynamic and more rich uh, price models. For example, it is possible to add fees uh, and, and add other price, mo uh, price models. For example, if you have a pay-per-use model, you can add a one-time payment, an initial payment. So when you buy, you pay one time, and then the rest of the consumption of the service, you are going to be charged in a pay-per-use basis, for example. Or you can create some dynamic stuff. You may have pay-per-use model, and you can create a discount. Uh, for example, if the user makes more than 10,000 calls during the charging period, for example, during a month, you are going to give him a 2% discount in the final invoice, for example. These are the kind of models that can be created with this software. Okay, uh, as part of the different offers that you can register in the business uh, ecosystem, uh, well, you can provide the terms and conditions. Uh, this software is, pro is giving you different ways of providing these terms and conditions. In data-specific environments, on data-specific use cases, the business ecosystem has built in a couple of typical data licenses you can choose. <coughs> if not, uh, it is providing some kind of wizard that you can use if you want to use it in order to create your terms and conditions. And if any of these is okay for you, you can always provide your own terms and conditions, writing them down. A fully custom license, and you can provide it. And well, uh, it is also possible when you are creating an offer in the business API ecosystem to specify different kind of service level agreements that uh, are to be satisfied. Okay, and well, the final fe important feature that we have in the business API ecosystem is the support for the revenue sharing models. Uh, the, uh, if you have a scenario where there are multiple providers involved in the monetization of a specific offer, it is possible to create these revenue sharing models. These revenue sharing models establish how the incomes generated by a set of offers must be distributed among the different stakeholders. It's basically uh, you have to provide which percentage of the total incomes are going to be retrieved by the provider, the one creating the offer in the marketplace, and which provider is going to be uh, is going to be sent to the different stakeholders involved in the offer. In addition to this, this uh, the business ecosystem is supporting something which is called the platform percentage. When you are creating a revenue sharing model, you will see that there is something fixed, which is this platform percentage. This is a percentage that is given by configuration of the marketplace instance and is intended to those use cases where the marketplace provider, the one that is deploying the software of the marketplace, wants to get some 
percentage of all the transactions that are executed in this marketplace, okay? If there is a platform percentage defined, when you create a revenue sharing model, you have to take into account that uh, this is something that you cannot change. This, of course, this platform percentage can be zero. If the scenario, in, if the, the business model of the marketplace provider does not include this kind of payment, the platform percentage can be set to zero and then we can let the, the different providers to define their own revenue sharing models. Okay. <coughs> okay. So now I'm going to go a little bit deeper in some of the business API ecosystem concepts, mainly on those that are related uh, to objects that are managed by the TM Forum APIs. Okay. Well, uh, first of all, uh, the business API ecosystem is managing different elements that allow you to classify your products and allow that your products can be searched and easily discovered. Uh, those objects are taken from the TM Forum Catalog Management API and are two different kind of objects. On the one hand, we have categories. The categories are created by the system administrator. So all the providers in the system are going to have the same category list. And when you create your offer, you are able to choose what in what categories your offer is. The idea is that uh, when you access to the marketplace page, you are able to search by category. And well, you can group the offers by category and, and discover what are better for you. In addition to this, there is another way of classifying the different offers published in the system, which are the catalogs. The catalogs are created by the providers themselves. So the uh, provider can create different catalogs in order to group their own offers. The catalog can be used in order to search by catalog in a similar way as it is done by category, but just that the catalogs are created by the providers. An important note here is that all the offers in the system need to be part of a catalog. So at least you are going to have one catalog per provider. <coughs> okay, in addition to this product classification of elements, the TM Forum Catalog Management API is providing everything that is related with the product creation. So, well, we have on the one hand, uh, we have to know which is the asset. The, this asset is not part of the TM Forum. This is, uh, the asset is the real digital product that you are going to register in the system. That's it, the data, the file, the service, and its metadata. And then the object managed by the TM Forum are the, cut, the product specification and the product offering. The product specification is the definition of all the product-related information linked to the specific asset. That means the information of the asset, which are the product characteristics, which are the different attachments that you have in the system, that you have uh, for the product, uh, for example, pictures, documentation, or whatever. Everything that is related with the product is defined as part of a product specification. And then we have the product offering, which a product offering is linked with a product specification and define all the business-related information that is linked to a specific product specification. So it includes a link to the catalog where it is published, a link to the product the specification that is going to be published, and then includes the license and the terms and conditions, the service level agreement that is applying to this product offering, the pricing model that is going to be applied to this offering, uh, the different terms, and also the revenue sharing model that is going to be applied to this specific offer. An interesting point with the product specification and the product offerings is that uh, you can define bundles in the business API ecosystem. So, for example, uh, you can create two different offers offering two different products, and each of these offers may have their own price model. You can create a product offering bundle when you are selling these two product offers and there, for example, a better pricing model. You can add some kind of discount if you buy all this stuff together, for example. These are different models that can be done uh, using this, uh, this API. Uh, okay, another very important element 
within the business API ecosystem uh, APIs is the usage. As I have mentioned before, the TM4, the, the business API ecosystem software is supporting pay-per-use. But in order to be able to process a real payment uh, and a real offer that is under a pay-per-use model, you need the accounting information. You need the usage information. Okay? This is where the TM Forum Usage Management API is used. Uh, we have on the one hand something which is called the usage specification. The usage specification is an object that is used in order to define a type of user. So in a usage specification, you specify which are the units and which are the metrics that are going to be monitored for a specific offer or group of offers. Okay, if you have multiple offers as a provider uh, that has the same kind of uh, monitoring and the same kind of metrics, you can use the same usage specification to all of them. And then we have the usage document, which is the actual usage that has been made of a specific product specification asset during a specific period of time. Basically, the usage. It's, uh, it, this object, the usage document, also includes, uh, it's associated with the price. So when the when this usage document is uploaded into the system and the business API ecosystem calculates the amount of money relative to this specific usage document, that information is also placed as part of the usage document. So you can see together the actual consumption and also the price associated to that actual consumption. And well, uh, this usage document also establishes or also specified whether this money has been charged or not uh, from, the, from the user. One interesting point regarding the usage is that the business API ecosystem software is supporting two different ways of providing this information in the system. Because if you have some kind of service that you want to sell under a pay-per-use model, you need to monitor the usage of the service. So uh, as, a, as, a, as a data provider, uh, there are two ways of providing this information in the, in, the TM for, in the business API ecosystem. The simplest one, uh, you can push your accounting information. You can create the usage document and push that usage information and put that usage documents directly using the TM Forum Usage Management API, which is an API of the business ecosystem. You can just push the data. But we are also supporting something which is the pull mode. As I mentioned before, uh, when you sell some kind of digital asset, you, are, uh, you have created uh, an extension for it, a plugin that is loaded into the business API ecosystem. As, as I have mentioned before, there are a couple of handlers that you can implement in order to manage the life cycle of your offers. Okay. As part of those handlers, there is a handler that is intended uh, to generate these huge documents, which is the pull mode. You can develop a client for your accounting system, just in case your accounting system has an API or something like that. You can develop a client for your accounting system, place this client for your accounting system in this handler of the different extensions of the business API ecosystem, and then when uh, periodically the business API ecosystem is going to access your accounting software and is going to automatically generate the different usage documents that are then used in order to charge uh, the different users. Okay. Okay. And well, the final concepts uh, I want to show you are the, the ones related with the revenue sharing. Uh, first of all, uh, when we are playing with this revenue sharing, where you, where, you are, where you are going to have are the different revenue sharing models. As, as I have mentioned before, a revenue sharing model established how the money generated by a set of offerings has to be distributed among the different stakeholders that are involved in those set of offers. So basically, it, as, as I have mentioned before, this includes the platform percentage, the provider percentage, and a list with all the stakeholders and the percentage that each stakeholder is going to receive. You bind these revenue sharing models to the different offers, and every time an offer is bought, uh, what is going to be loaded in the system is a transaction. A transaction is a payment that has been made by the different customers 
which is linked to a specific revenue sharing model. Each transaction is linked to a particular revenue sharing model. So we have the revenue sharing models and we have the transactions. The last thing that we are going to have is the revenue sharing report, which is the result of applying a revenue sharing model to all its linked transactions. It's basically going to uh, sum up all the money. It's going to calculate how much money has to be sent to the per to the provider and how much money has to be sent to the stakeholders. And this information is part of the revenue sharing report. And that's it. Okay, uh, those are the main concepts that we have around the business API ecosystem software uh, generic enabler as a general generic enabler used in order to create uh, different marketplaces. And now we are going to see uh, how we have used the business API ecosystem software in order to generate this i for trust marketplace. Okay, well, the first thing that we have done in i for trust in order to uh, create this i for trust marketplace is integrating the marketplace with iShare protocol. So the idea is that you can have an i for trust marketplace instance and there might be uh, multiple organizations, the different participants in the data space, and each organization may have their own identity provider, as has been uh, uh, previously uh, explained. So each participant in the data space has their own identity provider, and the idea is that when they want to log in into the marketplace, they don't want to log with an identity provider that belongs to the i for trust uh, owner. They want to log using their own identity provider. So, uh, thanks to this integration that we have done of the marketplace with the ISA framework, this is feasible. You access to the marketplace and then you click on login. You are going to be prompted with all the different identity provider of the different participants that are part of the system. And then you are able to log in the system using your own credentials in your own identity provider. This is done following the ISER protocol and using the ISER JSON web token in order to authenticate the marketplace in the different IDPs. With this approach, it is also possible that uh, you, as a participant in the data space, you have your own context broker, you have your own identity uh, provider and your own uh, security framework. Your data is in your organization, but you can sell your data or whatever service you have in your, uh, in your organization through this marketplace, even if you are not the owner of the marketplace, okay? Well, this is more or less the scenario. I'm not going to go very deep on this because this scenario is going to be presented later in the demo and also Rajiv has gone regarding on how all this stuff uh, is working. But here you can see the thing. We have the marketplace, we have different organizations, different participants in the data space, and all of them can use the marketplace and lock in the marketplace using their own uh, identity provider and their own, their own identities. Uh, how, how is this working? Well, as I mentioned, you, antes, you access the marketplace, you select your identity provider. The marketplace is going to generate an iShare JSON web token, as has been explained before, signed with the marketplace participant uh, digital certificate, and is going to send it to the I, uh, to the identity provider to, to the ID, identity provider that has been chosen in the list. The identity provider is going to choose, is going to use this JSON web token in order to validate that the marketplace is a valid participant on the data space through the trust provider or, or the ISER satellite uh, component in particular. Uh, this is going to return as a login, a login a login URL, and then as you have this, the flow is, is as typical uh, is as a typical OpenID Connect flow. You got an authorization code that you obtain by an access token. I don't want to to go very deep on this because this has been already already presented. Okay, okay. So now uh, we have our iFortress marketplace integrated with the iShare protocol, so you can use your identity. Well, if you want to sell some data that you have in a context broker that is under your organization and is part of your, uh, of your architecture as a participant, in order to do that, we have created an extension. As I mentioned, all the digital assets in the marketplace are done, are monetized as extension. So in order to sell this kind of data, we have created a plugin for i for trust 
is a plugin for A4 Trust that uh, basically allows you to provide uh, all the metadata that is needed to the policy that is going to be applied uh, to the customers when they buy. Okay, so uh, when the product is created, uh, the information is validated, all the, the stuff is validated, and when the offer is acquired, the marketplace is going to create the specific policy with the data uh, in the specific authorization registry that has been that has been created, that has been provided. And well, uh, that's it from my side. Okay, so I think that the next one presenting might be you, Dennis. Yes. Yeah, um, just a thought before you start, Dennis. Um, if are there any questions so far for either of the sessions, <coughs> for iShare or for the marketplace? Okay, I see one question. Which information of data asset sharing is anchored, stored, and verified in blockchain? Now we get this information. Um, not sure which uh, information are you talking about, and which blockchain are you talking about? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Is it possible to support the scenarios yeah. such as authorize a user if he has bought something from the marketplace? Yes. Yeah. That's what you will see now at the presentation from Dennis. Yes, this is what Dennis is going to show. Okay, um, uh, so maybe it's uh, too good to be true looking for it. <laughs> yeah, you will see. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, let's continue with the session and please uh, feel free to uh, put your questions in the chat. Um, I am, I'm monitoring the chat as well, so I can answer them. Um, and of course, at the end of the session, we can again open the floor for questions. Yes, so with that, Dennis, um, you may continue. Okay, thank you. So my name is Dennis Wendland from Fiware, and together with my colleague Stefan Wiedemann, um, um, we will present the final presentation where we now put all of the things together which we have seen in the past days of this IFA Trust training. And this we will do whoop, um, using a reference example, which I will give an overview in the beginning, um, give some prerequisites that are needed, and then we will start with the first demonstration where you can see all of this in action um, using the flows also described by Rajiv um, today, and then giving a description of what's, what's actually happening technically. And then Stefan will take over with another demonstration, with another flow um, using verifiable credentials and also explaining um, about the technical details. And finally, we give some uh, hints on how to set up of all, all of these components. <clears throat> so let me start with the reference example. So this is a use case uh, which we use to showcase um, how all of these things can be put together. And in general, what we want to show is uh, how to delegate the access rights for a certain data service uh, within the trusted data space. And these should be delegated from an organizational to a user level um, where the actual service providers uh, will not need have to have any knowledge about the actual users which finally will access the service. There are different parties involved in our data space here, which you can also see on this diagram. Um, there's a packet delivery company offering delivery order services. Uh, these services are offered on a marketplace 
instance in our data space. There are different retailers um, that will acquire access to the service offering and these retailers will delegate these access rights to their customers. And what's also required is a trustless authority within the data space, uh, which is actually the iShare satellite, uh, which ensures trust among the different organizations. Now, this packet delivery company um, is a typical delivery company for, for packets and um, it provides a digital service for its delivery orders. And in general, a delivery order um, is now mapped as a digital twin. So it's an entity in the context broker which will reside within the environment of this packet delivery company. And um, these entities are characterized by certain attributes like an um, issuer or a destiny of the packets, um, an origin or delivery addresses, and also planned um, dates and times of the arrival of the packets and also an estimated day and time of arrival, just for an example. And this digital service is offered on different levels. Um, there's a standard level, which only provides read access to these delivery orders on the digital service. And there's a gold service, which will also allow to change certain attributes, like for instance, the planned time of arrival, um, so there will be two different offerings on the marketplace, which can be acquired by these different retailer organizations. And depending on which offering they acquire, they can allow now then their users either only to have an read access to these delivery orders to view when, when there's, um, for instance, when, when the packet is planned to arrive or even allow them to change the planned time of arrival. So these retailers, as I said, will acquire these offerings and um, offer these to their customers. Um, this means um, basically if a customer would now um, order something on these shops, um, there will be a delivery order created so that there's a packet to be delivered and then these customers can directly access this digital service of this packet delivery company, um, either with read or also with write access, depending on the required service offering. Now, um, for the demonstration and the setup, um, some prerequisites so that we know um, what, um, what's going on. <clears throat> Just giving an overview of the actual architecture of these different organizations in our data place. So on the one hand, we have the marketplace, uh, which we have also learned from Francisco now, um, which is based on the business API ecosystem. Um, we have this organization of the packet delivery company where we have different components, um, especially the context broker, of course, where the actual delivery order entities are stored. Um, there's an IDP which is used for, for login purposes, um, as also presented. For instance, when, when such employee of this packet delivery company would like to, to log in on the marketplace to create offerings, for instance, um, there is a portal application, which is just some simple graphical user interface for the users that wants to access the service, uh, PEP and PDP component, um, which control and manage the access to the context broker. So, which actually provides this PEP actually provides then the the actual endpoint exposes it to the outside, and an instance of the authorization registry where access policies are stored. Then the environments of the different retailer shops are um, similar. Um, there will be some some shop system, of course, where 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 customers can um, order things, and then there are also instances of identity providers. Um, which for, for instance, that users or customers can also log in and also they have their own authorization registries where they store their um, policies on the user level. So policies where they delegate access rights to the users. And then there's the iShare satellite as trust authority in the data space. The marketplace, um, I think I can go over this quickly. Um, Francisco already introduced it, consists of um, several subcomponents, requires uh, some databases, MongoDB and a MySQL database, 
for the different components. Um, there's a component implementing the different TM forum APIs, which is interacting with the MySQL database. Um, there are components, um, component for charging backend, um, which is relevant for the charging and billing um, of offerings. There's a component called RSS, which is for the revenue settlement and sharing, and um, a logic proxy, which fulfills on the one hand, the role of the actual UI interface of the marketplace, and also as an API orchestrator uh, for the different components. Then the trust authority, um, we are using um, here the iShare satellite. There um, is a test instance available provided by iShare. There each of these organizations um, in our use case are all registered with their own EORI IDs. So there's a registration for the marketplace, for the packet delivery company, um, for these two retailers, uh, Happy Pets and No Cheaper, uh, which is what we call them here. And um, of course, the iShare satellite itself also has some such ID. And using the satellite, um, in each interaction, every participant in the data space can all the time verify the status of each other organization. Now, the shops. Um, so in this demonstration of our reference example, we of course focus on the actual data exchange. Um, so it was a packet delivery company. So um, actually there will be no shop system. Um, so we will just assume that there was already some customer which uh, ordered something on the sh shop and, and therefore there is already a pre-existing entity on the context broker as packet delivery company representing the actual delivery order. Um, we have two identity providers actually. One is um, reserved for, for the company employees of this Happy Pets shop itself, which allows them, for instance, to log in on the marketplace to acquire the service offering of Packet Delivery Company. And there's a second one for the customers, which they, on the one hand, would use to log in on the actual shop system of Happy Pets, but can also use to, to log in, for instance, in a, um, later on on the portal of the Packet Delivery Company using the processes um, explained by Rajiv. Uh, as I said, there's an authorization registry where we already created a policy which states um, so um, that certain customer of Happy Pets is allowed to um, perform requests on entities of type delivery order and um, can perform get requests and patch requests. So these are the actual HTTP methods also of the context broker. And for the patch, it's only allowed to um, modify the attributes called PTA and PDA, so the planned time and date of arrival. So in this case, Happy Pets, Pets will be an organization uh, that will acquire the premium offering of packet delivery company, um, so which allows them to delegate these access rights later on to their customers. Um, but this is a pre-existing uh, policy here now for the, for the actual users. Similar for now cheaper, um, there we say, okay, this will be an um, organization that will acquire the standard offering, only allowing read access. So they will create access policies in their own authorization registry, delegating only these um, policies with get access rights um, to their users um, for also accessing entities of type delivery order at this packet delivery company service. Then um, packet delivery company, as I said, there's a portal application. We have some simple demo application available, but which is really only dedicated for this specific reference example here. Um, but this implements all the different flows um, relevant for, for the use case. Um, the identity provider is actually only used for the for this employee of packet delivery company so that he can log in on the marketplace and create the offerings for, for their digital service. And of course, there's an instance of the context broker which provides the NGS ILD API um, for reading uh, and changing entities of the type of delivery order. And now also for this reference example, since we assume their um, customer already 
ordered something on the retailers and there's already a, diff a delivery order created. Um, the initial delivery order uh, needs to be created manually. It's something we already done. Um, this is how something, how this could look like. So typical um, entity in the context broker um, with a type of delivery order and certain attributes here. Then there's an um, PEP and PDP components. This is where we use Kong um, with a certain plugin, which is performing the access management according to iShare for uh, NGSI LD requests. Um, then there's an instance of the authorization registry, um, which holds the organizational access policies. So at the moment, there are uh, none of them. But as soon as now an um, employee of these retailer shops would acquire um, an offering on the marketplace, there would be certain policies created um, which state that the organization actually um, has access to the service and can delegate these access rights to the uh, customers. In addition, there's an activation service in front of the authorization registry. Um, there's also a simple implementation available. This is actually re only required um, for the, that the marketplace is actually able to create policies at the registry of the packet delivery company because normally you, um, only the, the owner um, can, can create policies uh, which state, okay, the, the, the issuer, for instance, packet delivery company um, um, gives access rights to a certain access subject. Uh, only packet delivery company could create such um, policy. So we place this activation service in front. Um, so there's an additional policy required, which states that um, within this packet delivery company authorization registry that the marketplace will be allowed to create delegation evidences. So at, after this point, uh, when this policy uh, was created, the marketplace is able um, to create policies here on behalf of packet delivery company in their own authorization registry. Now let's come to the demonstration. So what I'm skipping now is um, the part of the creation of an offering because we have seen it in, in Francisco's presentation. So um, as you can see, there are already um, some and there's especially this basic premium offering uh, of packet delivery company. So now we assume um, an employee of this packet delivery company created these offerings. And now let's assume um, I'm now an employee of this Happy Pets retailer shop, so some administrative user. So I want to log in on the marketplace. Um, so I'm listed now the different IDPs in our data space. Um, I'm selecting the one from my own organization, which is Happy Pets, I'm selecting sign in. So now I'm forwarded to the um, IDP, which is in this case Keyrock, um, of the Happy Pets company and log in as this employee user. So now, um, since Happy Pets wants to acquire this premium offering, I can have a look here. Um, there's some description and in the characteristics, I see, okay, it's an NGS ILD data service, which is offered here. I see the endpoint um, with the URL. And I can see, okay, I will be able to access entities of type delivery order I will get permission to perform patch requests for the attributes of PTA and PDA of the entities and um, get access rights for all the attributes. So there's a wildcard here. Um, now, before I acquire the service offering, let me first um, show you that actually the, the access currently is not working, of course, so that this is all, um, uh, real happening here. So let's have a quick look at this actual portal of the packet delivery company. Now let's switch roles. I'm a customer of Happy Pets. And similar to the marketplace, um, I offer different identity providers for login. Um, so I'm, since I'm a customer of Happy Pets, I'm choosing this one. I will log in as a um, customer of Happy Pets. Now what I will try is to um, 
uh, read uh, the, the, the values of a certain delivery order entity, um, a packet delivery company, which has a certain ID here. I'm hitting the button and now from the um, PEP and PDP, I'm getting an error message back that uh, actually there's no, no policy authorizing this access. So just showing actually it's not working, but now switching back to the marketplace, I'm now an employee of Happy Pets. Um, I will review this again, add it to my cart, perform the checkout. Um, we now put no, have not put no price plan on it, but basically this could be some, some price plan for instance. But so now what happened now is that the marketplace created a policy. It's a registry of packet delivery company, which states that from now on Happy Pets is allowed to, to delegate access rights to their customers. So now let's try again. Um, I'm still logged in as this customer of Happy Pets. I'm retrieving the delivery order and now I'm getting the response from the context broker. Pretty simple here with the different attributes. And since um, Happy Pets acquired the premium service offering, um, I can any perform, even can perform the, the patch operations. So let's say uh, I want to get my packet rather in the in the evening. So I'm hitting change. What will happen now is that this application will send now a patch request to the PEP of packet delivery company, which again um, checks the permissions and then forwards the request to the context broker. Afterwards, we'll retrieve the changed delivery order again. And now as you can see, the planned time of arrival has changed. Okay, um, maybe for a second example, now for this no cheaper, I will sign in again now as an employee of the Node Cheaper organization. So now I'm forwarded to a different IDP from this Node Cheaper organization and log in as employee user. Now for Node Cheaper, they are only interested in this basic offering, which only allow, allows read access. It's also seen here in the, in the characteristics. So there are no patch permissions. Um, adding this to my card. and performing the checkout. So, and now on the portal, um, I'm logging in now as a customer of no cheaper. So I'm choosing their IDP. And now I'm customer of them now trying to retrieve a um, certain delivery order, which works of course, since I have the get permission. But now when I try to change the planned time of arrival and let's say to retrieve it in the morning. It states that the user policy is not authorized. Um, and what we even can try now is the second example. I need to look out here. Because I have a second user registered at no cheaper, um, which is called the GT customer because this customer actually has um, in the registry of no cheaper, there's a policy stating that this user can perform get and patch, but still the organization no cheaper itself is not allowed to delegate these patch access rights. So what will happen now when this guy um, retrieves the delivery order, it will of course work because he, the user policy states he can perform get requests and the organizational policy of no cheaper states it can perform get requests. But now if the user um, also tries now to change as to send a patch request, this is also denied, but this time not um, because of that the user's policy doesn't allow it, but just because the uh, policy of the organization which was issued to the no cheaper organization um, doesn't allow to perform these patch requests. So that's basically the demonstration of all of it. And so um, coming back to the presentation, um, to have a look now what actually happened in the background. I didn't show what um, didn't show how to create an offering um, because it's also rather simple. And, and we have seen it in the Francisco's presentation. There's basically just some interactions when this employee logs in at the marketplace, chooses um, the IDP of, of the um, packet delivery company, 
He has a login based on the OpenID Connect standard. Um, there's an interaction of the IDP with the satellite, whether this marketplace is an um, trusted party of the data space. And when he's logged in, um, he would create the offering and provide all the information, which we have also seen in the um, product characteristics on the marketplace. Now, when the acquisition took place, um, there's a bit more happening. So what we've seen, I, I logged in as an employee of Happy Pets on the marketplace. I've chosen the IDP of Happy Pets. There again was an interaction with the satellite, whether the marketplace is a trusted party. When the login uh, was done, um, this employee um, selected this premium offering and um, performed the checkout. And what then happens is that the marketplace, and particularly the, the charging backend component, is it actually, um, will create the access policy um, for the Happy Pets organization at the registry of packet delivery company. So which looks like this, stating, okay, the organization of packet delivery company is issuing this policy to the organization of Happy Pets um, stating these patch and get permissions um, for delivery orders and it's creating this at the authorization registry. And as I said before, this is not directly sent to the registry but rather to the activation service in front because otherwise the marketplace wouldn't be allowed to create such such policy actually. For no cheaper, it uh, works similarly, but just that the policy that was created doesn't contain this patch permissions. And now when accessing the service, um, I am, I was this customer, so um, entered this portal of the packet delivery company, also chose the IDP, which in this case was the IDP of the Happy Pets company, and after login, um, I, I um, requested details about a particular delivery order and performed this patch operation. So what's happening is um, that during the login process, the, the IDP will issue um, a JSON web token, which will contain the policies um, of the actual user because these are stored here in the authorization registry. And this will have substructure here. So stating that the Happy Pets organization is issuing to a certain user um, this, this access policy. And this is contained in the, in the access token. And when um, he issues now a request using the portal to the PEP, of packet delivery company, um, there will be a verification of the JSON web tokens because these are signed, of course, with the private key of Happy Pets. And um, then there's a check, of course, if the policy allows the certain operations, so for instance, performing the patch request. And there's another check at the registry of packet delivery company whether actually Happy Pets is allowed to delegate such access rights. And if both of these uh, policies are fine, um, as we can see here, um, access is granted. So basically the PDP will perform two checks. Uh, on the one hand, is there such policy issued by packet delivery company to Happy Pets? And is there um, such policy issued by Happy Pets to the customer so that you have a chain of these delegation of this access rights for, for accessing the service? In the scenario of no cheaper, um, actually it's basically the same, but just the different policies uh, missing these patch permissions. Um, another scenario that I at least want to mention, I didn't show it now, um, but it's also possible because now we focused on these human to machine interactions where human identities are involved. Of course, um, similar mechanisms also work with uh, machine to machine interactions. Uh, Rajiv has already explained that earlier. Um, Basically, possible use case, um, it's not implemented now, but what one could think of is um, that the actual creation of a delivery order, um, when when the customer is um, ordering something on, on the retailer online shop, um, um, that shop system will create the delivery order at the packet delivery company. So that would be, for instance, um, a purely machine-to-machine -machine interaction where the shop system would directly create um, the, the um, delivery order 
this would require uh, an additional offering to be placed on the marketplace, which also such retailerships could, could acquire. Um, and there would be also policies issued to the retailer organizations, allowing them post requests to actually initially create uh, entities uh, of type delivery order. In this case, not, no humans are involved. And in this case, the flow is, um, is pictured here. So in this case, the shop system would directly create a signed JSON web token as explained also by Rajiv, signed with their own private key, uh, which allows to identify and would request an access token at the package delivery company. Um, the IDP Keyrock is able to, to issue such, such access, access tokens for the machine to machine interactions. Um, in this case also, um, Happy Pets would be checked uh, against the satellite as a trusted party. And then an access token would be returned. And then the shop system could send a post request together with the access token to the PEP um, with the NGS ILD request to create a delivery order. Um, then again, the PDP would check against the registry whether uh, the pets actually allowed to perform these post operations to create entities. And then this request would be forward. So basically similar. Uh, but only with the difference that there's no human involved and basically no, 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 the IDP is not required uh, for users to log in in this case. Here showing um, so some more details. So this is how such request would look like to obtain the access token at the um, endpoint of packet delivery company with a machine to machine flow in iShare. Um, this would be the information of this access token, which is issued by the packet delivery company to the Happy Pets organization. And then um, when the NGS ILD request is sent, there would be checked against such policies, which would be required to perform this operation. Okay, then I would hand over now to my colleague Stefan um, to perform the next demonstration um, about um, a different flow of these interactions. And yeah, Stefan can give you more details about it. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Stefan Wiedemann, also from the Fire Foundation. And I will now basically present you the, let's say, next evolution of this framework, um, where we will also incorporate the usage of um, verifiable credentials um, for authorization. So um, some of you might have already heard of the flows uh, or of the protocols OITC for VP or SIP2. Um, and I will now show you how to put this actually in work in this, uh, yeah, in our Alpha Trust framework. I will not go into too much details of the very uh, of what a verifiable credential is. I hope you did see the presentation from Jesus last week. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's um, focus on questions about this after the presentation. Um, so yeah, okay, let's start. Um, with the demo, um, as you probably have seen in the packet delivery portal when Dennis opened it, um, we not only have the options to choose the um, IDP that we want to log in, but there is also the login with verifiable credentials button here. Um, um, to log in with a verifiable credential, we um, have to set up different uh, stuff in the marketplace, and I will start with exactly that. So um, the marketplace. Um, is now you now already familiar with the marketplace from Dennis and Francisco, um, and Francisco already presented you that we need to set up the IDPs of the um, participants in our marketplace. If you want to use verifiable credentials, um, we don't have this need to have um, IDPs uh, in the same way anymore, um, but we need to register our users as um, uh, issuers of verifiable credentials. That's why there is now a new field within the um, IDP um, configuration here, um, where you can set, uh, where you can uh, insert the issue or the ID um, from your participant. Um, in the future, when you also can use the verifiable credentials to log into the uh, marketplace, this is not needed at all anymore because the issue or the ID then can be retrieved from the used verifiable credential by the participant of the marketplace. Um, but for now, where we still log in with the old flow into the marketplace, um, we have to set up, uh, set the issue of the ID here so that it can be used um, for setting up all the required policies um, to verify and um, authorize the credential in the next steps. Okay, so I already prepared the issue of the ID for Happy Pets and the issue of the ID for No Cheaper so that we now can um, create an offering 
that uh, both of them can buy. Um, I will sign again in as packet delivery and I will actually create a specification and an offering uh, because there is quite a difference to the to what we already know from uh, uh, from the plugin that Francisco showed us. Um, I already prepared one for the for the standard service. You can see here that it has um, less uh, let's say less fields um, than the other one. Um, the most notable differences is that you have to define the verifiable credential type that a service supports and uh, the roles that an, a buyer of the service is allowed to issue. Um, I already defined the standard service and I will now start to define an additional service for, uh, let's say, for premium, uh, for premium customers. Um, basically the same that Dennis had also with his premium service where a user is allowed to change, um, let's say, the plan time of arrival of a packet, uh, of, a, yeah, of a delivery. Um, call it um, packet delivery premium service. I will go fast through those parts. Um, we now have another uh, an asset type here, which is the NGS ILD data service for verifiable credentials too. This is the, the one that now brings us the um, other form. Um, you can see here that um, all the uh, inform all the fields about um, uh, the HTTP calls and what you can uh, do with the actual uh, actual request are not in here anymore. But we now can set a list of roles that um, a user or a service is allowed to issue. Those roles have to be um, pre-created in the policy uh, in the authorization registry of the data provider. In our case, this would be packet delivery. And then we are defining here only what roles uh, uh, an, a data consumer is, is allowed to issue to its users. So I will fill out this quickly. Um, most of the early fields are basically exactly the same. You already know them. So let's quickly go through them. Just run only for a certain amount of time. We now tell that um, we allow the issuing of credentials of the type packet delivery service. And we tell it that gold customers and standard customers are allowed the issue issued. We can go further. Uh, yeah, we can upload a picture, but we don't need to. We now have to launch the, the service and create an offering that we then can, can acquire. We have to use the uh, product spec that I created right now. We put it to our marketplace. Uh, I skipped the price plan because that's really not the, the topic of this presentation. And I will launch the offering. So now we will have on the marketplace in, uh, available this new offering, if we go here, which is the packet delivery premium service. Um, when I now buy this service as Happy Pets, Let's go to the market and buy this. Um, I can see here that those are roles that are supported, that this is the packet delivery service uh, credential that is supported. This is the checkout process that you already know. Um, now there is a policy created within the packet delivery service authorization registry that allows us to assign those credentials. To log in here now with login verifiable credentials, um, we need a verifiable credential that we then can present basically through the OpenID um, for verified presentation flow um, uh, to our portal. Um, to do so, we now have to go to the um, verifiable credentials issuer of Happy Pets, which is an application. Okay, I already have a couple of credentials here. Um, but this is basically the application that the employee of Happy Pets will use to create a verifiable credential that it then can issue to its customers. And the customer can use it 
to log into the system then. I will now create um, such a um, credential. Um, the email address, uh, well, let's call it happy customer. We have the first name and the last name. Then we have to define the target entity um, that we want to um, use, uh, that, that we do uh, issue this credential for. This is important for the, for the credential because a credential can, be, uh, can basically be used in different contexts. Um, what we say here is um, we want that the role that we assign, it's called customer role, belongs to a packet delivery. Um, if the customer uses the same credential in a different context, um, for example, if he also wants to access the Happy Pets shop with it, um, Happy Pets might have different roles. Um, it would then also add an, enti uh, an entry with the, um, with the entity ID of Happy Pets and the role that belongs to Happy Pets. Um, we can see that better in the JSON representation of the verifiable credential here, because that's basically part of the credential subject. I might make this a bit bigger because the subject now holds a set of roles that can be evaluated by the PDP later. Um, the role that we did set here is um, the role gold customer in the target uh, uh, packet delivery. We can set multiple roles within one uh, target. So we could also add the standard uh, service here or whatever we also we else want. But we also can add um, additional entries here. And um, if we then send this uh, credential to, let's say, Happy Pets, um, this part will be ignored and only the roles of targeting Happy Pets will be used. Okay, that's our credential now. And now we have to basically offer it to our user. We can do this with this application easily um, by scanning the QR code with our wallet. I have a um, small wallet application on my mobile phone. Um, so let me scan this. You can see this here. Let's see. Okay, so I now have the credential on my phone and I can save it. And then I can go to the login where we have it here and scan this uh, QR code here with my uh, wallet. Again. Uh, there. And now the, the wallet asks me to send the credential. And when I click on send, we will now be redirected to the actual service um, because in the back end, the, uh, um, the uh, verifiable credential is now validated and exchanged uh, through a JWT token that is then used by the portal uh, application to connect through Kong with its uh, downstream services. Um, what I can do here now is basically exactly the same that Dennis showed you. Uh, actually, we can see now here that we are locked in as happy customer which was the name I added in the, in the credential. Um, when I now also do uh, get on the Happy Pets, I get my delivery order and I can also change this because I'm a gold customer. Oh, nice. So, um, I also bought the, um, already bought the uh, access for no cheaper for a standard service before the presentation to um, basically save some time. Um, so we can also check that when we now log in through the same mechanism um, as a customer of NoCheaper, we have to go again to the NoCheaper credentials issue. We would have more time. This is also something that could be done by some of you, but I think we're running out of time if we do this. Um, I give it uh, another name so that we can differentiate them. And again, packet delivery and the role standard customer now. And we create the service. We have this here. And now I can again scan this with my wallet so that I have the new credential in my mobile. There. There it is again. And now log into the portal with it. I send the credential again. And now we are logged in as standard customer. Um, we can get the 
the delivery order for no cheaper. What did I do wrong here? So probably I deleted the, the service that I bought. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Okay, <laughs> let's skip this part. I think uh, my uh, it already timed out. Um, I will rather use the time to uh, explain what we did in the background, um, so that you um, also get an idea um, what uh, was um, acting wrong now at this time. Um, so the every acquired service currently is only limited to a certain time, and then our policies do time out. Um, which is mostly that we can reuse the same instance for demo purposes and i probably bought it for not long enough okay so but uh rather go to the to what actually happened in the background because that's the um i would say more interesting part of this um let's start with the exact same flow that dennis did because um in the end we're using the same system uh with some smaller differences uh, some small differences um, the most important difference to the uh, system that Dennis presented is that uh, normally the, the uh, participants don't need an IDM system anymore. Um, so since we are using verifiable credentials, there is no, uh, let's say, key rock where the Happy Pets employees or Happy Pets customers uh, should log in, but instead they get the verifiable credential issued that they then will use to authorize. We still have the key rock deployed currently, um, because we needed to log into the marketplace because the marketplace is not currently using the verifiable credentials for authorization, but it's something that will come at the beginning of next year. So um, there will be an option to have this really without any IDM system running. Um, for happy pets and no cheaper, obviously, is when they don't need, don't have an IDM system to log into, they will need an issuer for verifiable credentials. You have seen one potential implementation uh, right now that uh, I used to to issue my credentials. There are most probably different ones in the future, um, but we already have this one that can be used under Fiverr. And in packet delivery, we will have the credentials verifier because we need uh, some component that actually checks that this is a valid, a valid credential issued by someone that we trust. Um, we still have the trust authority that will be used to verify the, the issuers. And we also will have the PEP proxy and the PDP in this case, actually, we will have also the PEP proxy and the PDP as separate components um, because we use a different PDP than we are using. And we use the NGSI, uh, uh, the, the um, iShare policies in a way that Dennis showed that. Okay, um, we need some additional configuration to the things that, that we had before. On the marketplace, uh, if, uh, as I already showed, we need to configure the issue DID for the participants. Um, so that it can be used later in the policies. For packet delivery, we need to deploy the credentials verifier. Um, we have to set up the DSPA PDP. Um, the DSPA PDP is basically the policy decision point that is able to uh, to understand the verifiable credentials, to um, fulfill all the flows, to get the policies um, used there and evaluate the policies. Um, and we also need to create the roles that we can offer on the marketplace. Um, a role uh, in our system is also just the policy on the authorization registry. Um, so this will look very familiar to you, but uh, the, basically the only difference to the flow that Dennis showed is that the access subject is not, uh, not a participant and not an end user from an IDP, but instead basically the name of our role. So if we define the role uh, premium customer, we have a policy, uh, 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 policy defined um, from our issue packet delivery um, with the access subject premium customer and the policy in there um, as the, the type delivery order that allows basically for all identifiers and all attributes, uh, a get and the patch. Um, that would be the role premium customer that we then can offer on, a, on our marketplace to be used. And for happy pets and no cheaper, we need also to deploy the credentials issue, uh, the credentials issue obviously, because they need to issue the credentials to their users. Okay, now you've seen that I created an offering. Um, actually, creating an offering in this uh, setup doesn't need any interaction of the marketplace with the packet delivery uh, uh, yeah, with packet delivery anymore. So the employee of packet delivery simply logs into the marketplace and will create the offering um, with the uh, 
uh, with the information that you've seen. So um, basically, where is the service endpoint? Which roles do we offer? Which type of um, verifiable credentials do we support? In our case, the packet delivery service. And also uh, all the other terms and conditions and the pricing. And yeah, what's all else to be said about uh, an offering, basically. On acquisition of an offering, we then actually have the interaction between the marketplace and the packet delivery company. Um, the login steps are still the same as Dennis showed. Um, the employee of packet delivery then can uh, uh, of the of Happy Pets then can select our packet delivery premium service and will perform the checkout process, including um, providing the payment details and doing all the payment stuff. After this happened, the marketplace will request the authorization registry, also again through the activation service um, of packet delivery to uh, register a policy that will register Happy Pets as a trusted issuer that is allowed to issue verifiable credentials um, of the certain uh, with the certain roles to its customers. Um, the policy that will be created in this step um, will look like this one. So we again have packet delivery as the policy issuer. And this time the access subject is not a role or a user or again, another um, you know, a participant in terms of iShare. And in this case, it will be the um, it will be the issuer uh, the ID that we defined uh, previously in our uh, in our uh, marketplace. Um, and for this issuer, we create a policy to uh, um, create resources of the or to issue resources of type packet delivery service um, with uh, the roles premium customer and standard customer. Um, so if we have this. Um, this uh, policy registered, the PDP in the future can check that, packet, that our Happy Pets issue is actually allowed to issue such credentials. Um, the authorization registry um, also will again uh, run through the typical flow, uh, the normal flows of iShare. Um, therefore, contact uh, also the trust authority um, if the marketplace is actually allowed to do so. And yeah, that's basically what we need to have. Um, those roles, uh, uh, the, the acquisition process will not check if those roles actually exist um, because they are only evaluated once uh, someone accesses it uh, later. Um, now we need to do the issuing of the verifiable credential that you also have seen. Um, this will only involve the system of Happy Pets here. Um, an employee of Happy Pet then can create a verifiable credential. Um, this is basically how a verifiable credential looks in JSON. So we have a context, we have schemas, then we have the, in our case, important part of the credential subject. This is basically defined by the type of the credential. Um, uh, okay, I left actually out the type of credential, should have put it in here. So uh, a credential, in our case, of type packet delivery service um, expects to have a family name, first name, and this uh, roles field. So the, the Happy Pets customer now gets a, uh, credential issued with the role premium customer and the target packet delivery. And as we can see in the in the verifiable credential, the issuer is also uh, um, basically encoded. Um, the customer itself can then store this verifiable credential into its wallet and use it for authorization later, um, which he has to do when he uses the data service here. Um, for using it, um, the customer of Happy Pets um, will go to the to the portal application or to the to the uh, packet delivery portal, and the portal will for login um, present the this QR code that I scanned, um, which shows the information about how the OID, uh, the the, the Cyber two flow or Open ID Connect for verifiable presentations flow, uh, will uh, be initiated. Then the customer can scan this uh, can scan this login QR code with his wallet. And the wallet will send the verifiable credential um, to the verifier that is actually encoded within this um, QR code. Um, the verifier here will then verify this credential. That means uh, it will basically check that the that this uh, in our case that it's uh, signed correctly with the correct private key, and also that um, our issuer is trusted by the um, trusted issuer's registry. Um, we're currently working on making um, the trust authority and iShare also an uh, IFA trust also compatible with the um, trusted issuers registry. This is also currently under development and will probably be, be available at the end of January. 
Um, once this is done, the credentials verifier basically takes the verifiable credential and exchanges it um, with a JWT token. Um, this JWT token then is sent back to the portal and the portal will contact um, the PEP proxy. The PEP in our case is Kong. And we wrote a small plugin for Kong um, that's called external ops or a PEP, no, no, it's called PEP plugin, which has a mode uh, called external ops. Um, this plugin uh, will um, become active once you access the, uh, once you configure it for a service, and then we'll forward the request to the uh, policy decision point. Um, the policy decision point is our um, DSBA PDP, and this PDP um, will in the end uh, do two checks. First, it will go to the authorization registry and check that the issuer is allowed to issue actually this credential, which means it will check if the policy um, from packet delivery to our issuer DID exists, and that is actually allowed to um, issue credentials of type packet delivery service and premium customer. If that's true, it goes to the second step of the um, to the second step of the uh, um, authorization process, um, which is checking that the role that we assigned is actually allowed to make this call. Which means when we get a get call to our um, context broker for a delivery order, it will then check that this get is actually covered by the uh, by the policy that we uh, did set up for premium customer. Um, if that's okay, it will simply pass the, uh, the request through to the context broker and the portal can, um, can uh, show the results of that. Yeah, mm, that's more or less the whole flow. Um, I think, I'm not sure, Dennis, do you want to talk again about something? Um, if you want, you can quickly go through the following yeah. slides. It's just a list of the components and Material. Yeah, so, so next slides is really something that you can better look, uh, take a look afterwards. I will quickly go through because it um, simply has a, a lot of links to all the components that we have in here. Um, so what you need for deploying the marketplace is um, something called the business API ecosystem. Um, we have a lot of hand charts available for us. Do you can um, find all of them here? Um, the marketplace consists of yeah, basically it's the microservice architecture consisting of the logic proxy, the charging backend, and some additional APIs that will be deployed all together with their databases. Um, we have also the, the identity provider, the key rock here, um, which needs to be deployed for no cheaper happy pets and packet delivery. Um, we also have hand charts available for that. So you can find um, recommendations on how to set it up on, key, uh, on Kubernetes. You can also set it up on Docker. Um, yeah depending on your uh, requirements. Then we have the context broker. Um, we usually use Orion LD in our setups, um, but in the end, it's not a requirement. You can also use Scorpio, Stelio, or whatever you want. <laughs> so that's uh, another option. Um, we link the deployments for Orion in our um, tutorials. Um, then we have the deployment of Kong. Um, Kong is... Um, yeah, as our PP proxy that we use in both scenarios um, with different uh, configurations of our plugins. Um, one for the um, iShare, NGSI iShare policies plugin, um, which uh, was used in Dennis' um, example use case. Um, and the other one is the PEP plugin, which I used. Um, both of them are basically packaged in our um, Kong, in, in our Kong image. Um, to be yeah, provided for for the for usage, um, you can find more detailed um, information about how to configure Kong here. Um, it's usually always the the same uh, way. You set up a, a backend host. In our case, it's Orion, um, and you assign this to a certain route. Um, this will be under the path packet delivery. So you will have you will basically get all calls to the uh, host of Kong with a bar slash packet delivery um, forwarded to this plugin. Um, the NGSI iShare policies plugin needs some um, information about the authorization registry, the satellite, and its own identity um, so that it can do the authorization um, in the next steps. Um, the plugin for verifiable credentials um, is uh, configured um, more or less the same. You again set, set the host and bind it to a path. Um, the plugin itself doesn't need so much information because um, it only does forward the um, request 
to an external uh, endpoint that then will do the decision um, in uh, for the plugin. Um, we have some installations of a verifier and issuer uh, or some components to act as verifier and issuer. Um, they are also currently under development. They will also be finished at the end of January. Um, you can already see how they are deployed in our environment. So I linked the um, demo environments that I used uh, uh, for the presentation here. Um, we also, again, provide Helm charts for them, uh, but they also can be run as plain Docker containers. So that's quite trivial, I would say. Um, then we have the packet delivery portal and the authorization uh, activation service. Um, those are really only demo applications, so uh, we don't recommend to use them in a production environment. They are only here for our demonstration purposes. Um, but if you want to get started and play around a little, you can find all the resources to install them here. We have um, more, in uh, more information about the iShare um, authorization registry and the scheme owner. Um, we again have uh, linked it here. So authorization registry uh, is available in different, uh, let's say, implementations. Um, you can either use the uh, test instance from iShare. Um, you can use Keyrock for that because it also implements the endpoints required for an authorization registry. And there are uh, there is the um, alternative to set up your own authorization registry according to the iShare um, tutorials that you can find here. Um, uh, okay, that's uh, basically a summary of the deployment instructions that I showed you here. Um, yeah, I hope that gets you started for your deployment. Um, did I miss something, Dennis? I know it was very quick, um, but I think it makes more sense to go through the actual um, links than only here yeah. about deployments. Exactly. I, I propose everyone to go through this offline a bit, um, especially for the developers to, to maybe have a closer look, uh, maybe have some hands-on where we have the, there's a tutorials repository linked here with instructions on how to deploy the reference example on um, using Helm charts. Uh, there's also another example using the OpenShift sandbox if you want to try this out. And there's also linked on our actual GitOps uh, repository, which we actually use for the um, deployment of this current reference example, which we have showed here for this demonstration. Um, so there's plenty of material to have a look on, on how to get uh, the components running. But I think, yeah, then thanks, Stefan. And I think that's all from the two of us and basically also the end of the session. So uh, I would then I think uh, hand over to Rajiv again. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dennis and Stefan. Um, yeah, I think with this, we are uh, able to conclude this session. Of course, the videos and slides will be available to you um, via our uh, various channels. Um, specifically, you can find them on GitHub and YouTube. Um, do we have, I, I see there were some uh, chat uh, questions going on in chat and Jesus has been answering them. But do we have more questions? Either please put them in chat or uh, raise your hand so we can ask you to um, speak it up. I know it's already six o'clock. <laughs> Yes, uh, I agree, <laughs> most of the questions. So of course, um, we have uh, regular sync with the mentors for all the all the experiment members who are um, with us in the second uh, round of mentoring program. Um, you have access to us uh, as well as all the mentors uh, who sync up with you regularly. So feel free to ask to them or also feel free to raise uh, technical questions in iPodrust help desk community. Um, and of course, you can also request uh, dedicated architecture workshops uh, with, with the experts on the topics so we can guide you on specific topics when needed. 
yes these presentations as i said and um, presentations as well as the recording of these videos will be made available okay i guess um, no further questions and then we can conclude uh, this call thanks dennis for sharing uh, <laughs> the link to the spaces where you can ask the questions um, yes um, I think then we can conclude this session and with this we also conclude the IFRTRUST training camp for this uh, this session and um, I wish you all the best uh, in, in your journey of implementation of IFRTRUST. Um, um, yeah, IFRTRUST uh, building blocks and uh, create uh, the very, very first data spaces uh, and be the front runner. Thank you everyone and thank you all the speakers. Thank you too, Rajiv. Thank you. Thank you.